three, two. Oh my God. Uh, what's up? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the program. The Airtime Podcast is presented by Van Shoes since 1966. There's nothing fake about it. Have something to believe in and be yourself. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Airtime, y'all's podcast. Yes, sir. All right. Next guest on the show. Super excited to introduce um, a friend of mine, somebody who has helped me out along my career and has uh, helped so many people out in snowboarding in one way or another professional park builder professional photographer boarding nerd somebody who wants to start a snowboard museum just all around somebody that aligns with everything that this podcast is about a true border through and through we got jeff patterson on the podcast how you doing boss doing fantastic Jody. thanks for that intro Wicked. Was it okay? <laughs> yeah, it was great. Maybe like I should have fluffed certain areas yeah, more than up, others. No. I was like, do I lean more into the photography? You know? Do I lean more into the park? Do I lean yeah. more into the snowboard collection? Like, what am I doing? You just it, you can lean more into everything. It was a uh, there's been many focuses, so it doesn't really matter. This way, it's all kind of tied together to the same stuff, so it's all good. You've been in the uh, in the game for a long time, so I'm excited to do this convo. Um, Maybe we'll start off with uh, a, a big question slash um, something that's important, which I think that you're uh, maybe the right candidate for this. Let's start off with a little bit of a history lesson here. Who invented the snowboard? Oh, geez. <laughs> the people Who need to know, man. This is a, this seems like a stressful um, one. I You know, I think it's stressful. I think, I think that question, when you're like, who invented the snowboard... I think it's something that causes a lot of uh, a lot of conversations because depending on when you were introduced to snowboarding or where you were introduced to snowboarding, I think that could change. I think in North America, where um, we've all been we've all been told and and look at the history of of how snowboarding started, and generally it points back to uh, to the snurfer, which is you know in the '60s, and it's a wooden board with a rope and some staples in it. And that was kind of where everyone usually leaned to with where snowboarding started. Um, but over the last, you know, quite a few years now, there's been some questions to that because there's been things that have come up uh, through some of the channels with even like the guys at Burton that put out some videos of, uh, I believe it's the Wickland, Wickland brothers who, who had a... Uh, a patent on a thing that was like a snowboard and had some historic, like some video of it. And, um, there's another company called the bunker toy company, which was this metal stand up sled, which was again, not like a snowboard, but it was similar in the way that you're standing sideways on this metal toy toboggan say. Um, and so that's kind of something. And if you look at those, there's like, those go way back before anyone was calling anything a, a ski board or a snurf or whatever. So in general, the snurfer it was the first kind of generation of what became snowboarding as far as the, the boat majority. But there are things prior to that that um, could also be considered the start. Um, and then you have to remember that we're not the only, you know, place in the world that has snow. So you open up the doors to looking into places like Japan and the Himalayas and Europe, and there's people in those places that were standing sideways on whatever they made for a long time as well. So we don't really know, like there's, I mean, you could, you could say one or the other. I'm not prepared to say who did it because, you know, I've seen, you know, like I look at, um, oh man, I'm total brain fart here, but. Uh, there's boards that people rode in the Himalayas that are like, they used a stick to kind of surf down the mountains between villages. And I think Jeremy Jones brought it up years ago. He brought one back from a trip. And uh, again, it's like first time I ever saw one in person. We were, I was up in, uh, uh, in Alaska for the deeper trip and he had brought one up there and like watched Gary Prantygrass do a run on one and he had it and did a run. And it was like a legit, I, I'm like, 
I should have like remembered my study up here and knew this was coming. But like, yeah, there's history in so many places. Um, I don't think it's fair to try to say who invented it. Um, because I think that no matter what you say, there could be someone else that started sliding sideways on something beforehand. But fair to say that the snurfer was the first uh, thing within North America that went to the masses that got kids standing sideways and starting to think about, you know, surfing on snow. Who do you think, so think won? The, who do you team. think won the race to, to making like the first snowboard with like bindings? Was it you're leaning towards Burton or like if you go, I googled it <laughs> yesterday and it said Tom Sims made the first snowboard in 1963, yeah. but it was like his own board. But then if another website was saying that Sherman Poppins did it, but then like you said, I went deep down the rabbit yeah. hole. And they start open up the the Himalayas and all these other mountains. Yeah. That like, well, no, these people have been doing this for hundreds. It, like, we don't know how long yeah. for transportation and for yeah. moving things around. And it's a pretty universal tool there. And then you're like, so I guess the that question can't be answered. Yeah, I mean, you can you can put timelines on stuff based on history and based on conversations. There's definitely, you know, it's it's just a matter of like, who do you who do you put that onto of saying yeah, they use the guys and i think that we've seen pictures of i know the one you're talking about tom's like the high school shop board it's like a metal bottom with some channels and stuff um and if there's a way like that's been presented as whatever the timeline was but it, then you can find other people that say well you know like that doesn't make any sense because of this and this and this you know so i you can't you can't say that it wasn't but you can't say that it really was unless there's like something else showing. So I, I mean, all of those things are huge parts of the sports history and deserve to be talked about and deserve to be like placed in wherever they are. But snowboards, I don't know, bindings, snowboards, like a first person with snowboard with bindings. Um, uh, <laughs> there, I guess if you, if you look back, um, is the binding like a strap over your foot? Or is a binding like a, an actual uh, latch? Because you know, if you look at if you look at the early boards that um, well, the guys like Sherman Poppin built, you were just standing on it. And then there's guys like Steve Dara who had flight boards, and they were the same. They were like a wooden snurfer with a handle and a and a, I think no handle. Kind of, to so, me, when I look at like what the invention of the snowboarding would be, snowboard yeah. would be would be no string, no handle, yeah. bindings of some sort strapping you to yeah. the board. So, so again, you look back at that, and you can go, um, you know, like I brought in a board here to show you. Like, you can go to the seventies, and there's um, Winter Stick who had no rope um, and had straps that would hold your feet in, and that is somewhat of a thing that retains your feet on the board, but I wouldn't consider it like a modern day binding, you know? Um, and then you have the early, you know, the eight in the eighties, you had your, your boards from Sims and Barfoot that had like rubber bungees and they held your foot on the board and they didn't have a rope. So again, it's kind of like the first binding, uh, if it was a clip buckle style binding, I mean, you can you can go to guys who made bindings. Like there's a Canadian guy, Louis Fournier, who it's arguable. Like uh, you go generationally to the first binding that was say folding or something like that, because there was modifications. Jeff Grell in the states had his own binding, um, and it was folding with a high back or whatever. And Louis had it one as well. Um, but I think there's like different versions of those old bindings that are that progressed with what people wanted boards to do and also with what boards could do. Because when you look at the old boards that were no side cut, no edges, and you were kind of okay to ride them in pow, but maybe not on ice. And then some <laughs> had fins and it was like, then you talk to guys who rode them and they're like pulling the fins off because as soon as you're on hard pack, you didn't want a fin hooking in to keep you straight. You wanted to be able to turn sideways. Um, so yeah, you look you look back and you can find you know the Londonberry like Burton's board. There's a you know their original boards had a had a rubber strap on your front foot, but still had a rope. And then guys stopped using the ropes and went to other things. And 
we can go pretty far back, like 83, 84, and there's still wooden boards by Burton that have holes in the nose, which originally had the rope. But I've been told it wasn't due to the fact that they needed the rope anymore. It was due to the fact that when they were finishing the boards in the factory, they needed some way to hang them to spray the coating on. So like the board that's behind me here, 84, and the year before at 83 had the exact same, it was the exact same board, just with a different binding setup. Um, but people weren't really tying ropes to them anymore with a handle. It was used because when they're in the factory to spray the varathane on them, they needed to, something to hang them with. So they just continued to have the holes that were originally there for the rope. But I will say yeah, the I can winter, go into a... <laughs> winter stick, man. The winter stick. If you haven't seen this board and you're not watching the video on YouTube, Google winter stick. What year is that board? Uh, this is 76. Yeah, like 1976 winter stick. Like that board, that shape, like we were talking about earlier offline, is a work of art. Yeah. It looks like, I yeah, don't know, it's, it, uh, it looks like you know, the perfect snowboard for that, like, it was, pow. It was designed for Utah, right? Like deep, cold pow. Um, and like not really thinking I should have brought, there was, I have a, I have, they had two versions that year. Um, this was a swallowtail and then they had a round tail as well. So the round tail shape they kept for years afterwards, but you know, they had, like you said, their kind of works art. Like there is no edges. It's P Tex base. It's got 3d channels. It's got textured top. It's got a strap for bindings. There's like a skeg that comes out. So it's kind of like a, a fin you would say, but there's a strap on your leg that when you fell, it would pull the pin and it's spring metal. So the, the thing that you see, I mean, you can't see it in here. Well, it's hard to, so there's a, there's a strap on this thing that, if you look on the bottom, you can take photos and show your show your listeners later. But I always, even the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, crazy. Like, it's just got a, a fin. And it was a couple of years before someone's like, oh, yeah, it's not just a fin. It's spring metal. And the leash would hook to your foot. So you'd be bombing down the hill. And if you fell off, the top was a pin. And it would slide out of the pin and pop the fin down. The spring metal would pop down so that the board would stop. So it was like a break for the snowboard. Because, you know, legitimately, you don't really have bindings, you have straps, so you're going to you're gonna come out of them. Um, and then they went on to do, you know, a couple of years later, they have like an actual soft binding with clasps that they started using. But the shapes that these boards were in the 70s, they continued to, to run into the 80s. Uh, mid to late 80s, they had round tails and swallow tails that all were pretty much the same mold that came off. Very similar shapes, very, like everything about them. They started putting some edges on stuff later on, but... Let's touch on the other board there. Okay. Like flight? Flight, yeah. Okay, so tell us the story about this board. This, the, this the particular? Flight, this particular board um, that's in the studio. Okay. Um, so I brought a, f a few boards today. I, I kind of, you know, nerding out on history. I wanted to bring something that was tied uh, to Canadian history a little bit. And also something that was unique. So Flight Snowboards um, was a company out of the States, the guy that made it, uh, Steve Dara. He was kind of an innovator and, and uh, one of those brands that kind of was around for a while and then faded away um but they started with kind of the wooden snurfer and then went to things like this so this is uh i uh now i'm doing it again but a board from uh 83 84 um very similar it's got 3d base profile it had edges that were um, pieced into it you can see somewhat like old skis uh and it did have some plastic bindings with clasp when it did have it i don't have the bindings for it but so this board was ridden um by lance mountain um, at the Worlds in, I think it was Soda Springs. And you can look, there's an old Sessions ad, I believe. Black and white photo with a flight snowboard of him. Who's Lance Mountain to those that don't know who uh, Lance If Mountain anyone doesn't is. know who Lance Mountain is, it's like <laughs> he is a legendary skateboarder. Um, and that's Lance Mountain's yeah, this, fucking snowboard. Yeah, so this was Lance Mountain's. Um, Sick. And, uh, and the story with it um, is, uh, I've, been collecting snowboards for a really long time and conversation with people on the lift through I was with uh, Ken Ock and a couple other buddies and they knew what I was trying to do trying to get this museum spurred up and looking for old boards and I hadn't spoken to Ken's brothers and I was really interested to see if they had uh, retained any boards from the past because Ken himself didn't really keep anything and the things he did keep got stolen years ago and I hadn't really had any direct connection um, so this mutual friend of ours uh, went on a trip a couple summers ago and was visiting one of Ken's brothers and mentioned, oh, you know, this guy Jeff's looking to find some snowboard history and, and uh, do this museum. And um, turns out 
one of Ken's brothers had a stash of snowboards in his basement that he brought to his house years ago was going to make into a fence. And very luckily for me, they didn't end up a fence. <laughs> um, and yeah, so he loaded them up in his truck and um, uh, Ken ended up uh, being Ken, sending me photos like one at a time with no information. And so I was up in, I was actually up in Calgary at work at the time with really terrible cell coverage. And the first board that came through was this flight. And they're really hard to find. They're, they didn't make a lot of those boards. So just seeing the board itself, I had no idea about the history. But immediately I'm trying to send texts to Ken, like, while I'm at work on this film set. Like, oh, no, where'd that board go? Whose is it? Can I check it out? I want to just take photos of it. Like, in no way I ever imagined it was going to be in my hands. I just wanted to know about it. And then, you know, half an hour later, another board came and another board came. And then finally I got back into cell coverage and I had to call Ken and he's like, are you at your house? And no, I wasn't, but he's like, okay, well, um, is anyone at your house? And I just said, well, no one's there right now, but here's the code to my garage. And he's like, okay, I'm dropping some stuff off for you. Basically that was the end. Of, that was kind of the end of the conversation. And I didn't really know what it was going to be and ended up, yeah, I came home to finding this like pretty large stash of very historical snowboards in my garage. Um, that all were part of the uh, original kind of early years of the snowboard shop in Calgary. And this particular board, um, Ken was at the Worlds. And the story that he told me was that um, at the time he had a couple of brands at the snowboard shop in Calgary and Lance gave him this board because he's like, you should check out these flight boards, like see if you can get some up because no one was bringing flight snowboards into Canada at the time. Um, so yeah, Ken brought it back and I would imagine a bunch of people probably wrote it. I mean, you, it's not... It's definitely not minty, but it's in, in shape. And so uh, he told me afterwards, I'm like going through everything. He's like, oh yeah, so that board I got from Lance at the, you know, the 84 Worlds. And immediately I'm like, I know, I know that board. Like I've, I've seen the photo and like super nerdy snowboard guy. So I'm trying to find the ad and yeah, you know, there's a session and there's a black and white sessions ad with uh, Lance Mountain. That's like doing the frontside air base shot of the flight board you know like it's and so it was like one of those cool things there's uh, I have a few pieces in my archives now that are like things that are you know to me they're just they're irreplaceable you can't I, if you could find the board itself great you can find one but to have the tie to the people that were involved early on um, and there was you know early in the sport obviously there was a lot of crossover between those original kind of OG skateboarders that were like oh let's try this out and totally. they were and they were obviously good at it because they were used to doing airs on their skateboards and they didn't have to have their feet tied in. And, you know, it was probably like such an easy thing for them to transition into. It made oh. snowboarding look, made snowboarding look good at the time. So, yeah, I mean, so that's a, that's like a, a cool piece of um, snowboarding history, but also like tied to uh, some really old Canadian history and, and ties to the area. So nice. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Lance Mountain Snowboard inside the airtime booth. <laughs> Who would have ever thought? Maybe <laughs> not me. Maybe yeah. let's uh, scoot back here. Yep. And when did you start snowboarding? When did you kind of discover this? And I also want you to kind of give us an idea, a description of what like a typical snowboarder looked like when you when you started. Because when I think of that era, I'm like, you know, are people like leaning towards Burton, where it seemed like really jockey and tight little suits in it, or like. Are people wearing neon colors? Like, give us a breakdown when you got into this and what snowboarders look like. When did I get into snowboarding? So, I would say the introduction to snowboarding for me came, um, I want to say it was the, would have been probably the winter of 1986. And it came through, uh, an older neighbor of mine in Cramrick, uh, Grant Taylor, actually, was his name. Uh, two brothers. They were super into motorbike and, you know, early skateboarding, you know, always going to their house and seeing Action Now magazine, which I don't know if you... It hasn't been a part of our world for years and years, but... Action Now? Action Now magazine was, um, for anyone who doesn't know, it was basically this uh, magazine in the 80s. I don't even know when it started, truthfully. Um that had action sports and it was like it was the entry portal for skateboarding snowboarding bmx anything to do with like a, a 
what was considered a cool sport at the time. I think motocross was in there. Anyway, they had these Action Now magazines, which was like eye-opening at the time. Even as a kid going over there, we'd be like, they'd be babysitting us. We'd be flipping through Action Now magazines. They're like, oh, there's surfing and there's skateboarding, all these things and people, right? And um, so they ordered through Action Now magazine, ordered this Burton snowboard. Um, and that would have been early on in, in uh, 1984, which is the one that's over my shoulder here. So years later, he's again, I was still tied into snowboarding years later and I'd already been collecting for years. And, and he reached out to me. I was back visiting my parents in Cranbrook and um, he reached out to me and was like, hey, do you want that old board of mine? And I was like, well, yeah, well, certainly. Like, I'd, I'd love to have that. Like, what do you want? And he's like, oh, I don't know, what, whatever. Give me a six pack or whatever. Like, I don't even remember what it was at the time. Um, but this board was in his house and and so they obviously ordered it and they wrote it a couple of times, but at the time, no, no ski hill was allowing snowboards to be on the ski hill. So they used it on the back, you know, in the hills in Cranbrook, um, just to play around on. And in reality, didn't really get very far with it. And, you know, pretty early primitive binding and, you know, fins and a wooden board, like it, it played on it, but it never got tons of use. It's like in super good shape. Um, and so he let me take it out a couple of years later. I remember like he let me borrow it and I like went out with some high top shoes or something and like tried to ride it down a hill same kind of thing it was like we'd go sledding on crazy carpets or whatever put it on and kind of slid it down the hill and oh that's cool and didn't really again he couldn't really do much on it it was probably I probably pointed it straight down the hill and fell over and beatered my back and sides up a whole bunch but I was like oh that's kind of cool and we were as kids into skateboarding and BMX and all that stuff so it was like oh this is kind of cool and Fast forward, it was, you know, a couple of years later, I was um, falling away from, I grew up in a very uh, big hockey, I think it's Cramer's a big hockey town, um, hockey family, hockey, everything. Um, started seeing these guys in town that were at, um, at the skateboard, like there's some skate ramps down the road. And actually, I thought about this on the way up today, one of the, the re-entry into snowboarding, which would have been... Um, when I really got hooked, it was on, uh, it would have been in the winter of 89. Um, and Rick Johnson, who went on to do a bunch of filming and like legendary in his own right, um, he lived in Cranbrook and he was uh, friends with a bunch of the like local, really like cool guys that we looked up to that were skateboarders. We rolled down one day to the where the skate ramps were at the fire hall and he had a, he had a bar foot. Um, that he had picked up in the in Calgary at the snowboard shop, and then my eyes were open. I was like, the thing had you know edges and bindings on it, and it was neon. <laughs> it was like big, big at the time. So to answer your question, um, that winter, uh, I ended up going down to Spokane and picking up a uh, board, which was the oh my, yeah, Kemper Rampage. It's a gray board, some flex on it, weighed about a million pounds three strap neon bindings that was kind of my start into um the like having a pro level board that i took up to the hill um that same winter decided that i was not going to play hockey anymore i was into freestyle skiing at the time and that ended right away so i uh, would do freestyle ski training in the morning and then as soon as we were supposed to like be done with our training and go ski the rest of the day i'd go throw my skis in the car and grab my snowboard and go snowboarding um, so my, my time freestyle skiing only lasted a couple months and the coach was like, what do you, like, you can't, you can't do this. So that was, that was it. It was, uh, from that point on hooked, it was, you know, from the Kemper, um, I found out very, very early on, you know, like I was whatever, 14 years old, like ridiculous, you know, like smaller kid riding these huge, it was like a 160 that weighed 40 pounds. I don't know. Anyway, I should have brought one of those. I do have one and they weigh it. They're tanks. And very quickly realized that that wasn't going to get me anywhere and ended up buying um, a Mystery Air. Craig Kelly Mystery Air was my next board, um, which was a game changer because it was like way lighter. The shape was great. The flex was great. Two strap bindings with high backs. You know, everything started coming together. Um, and how that looked at the time, it was um, a lot of, you know, either there was a lot of people wearing like Kemper gear, which at the time was neon. You could buy like white jackets, fluorescent pink jackets, fluorescent green jackets, or a color combination of any of those. Um, 
which yeah, I'm laughing about it now, but everyone was wearing like it was either neon or I think at the time Burton stuff was, um, uh, it's kind of that iconic. It was like yellow. There was a lot of like yellow pants with knee patches and or like red and yellow. But yeah, not, it wasn't super jockey or anything at the time. I think it was more of like snowboarding trying to find itself. And uh, Kemper had, I think Salter maybe was involved early on that and like had taken over Kemper and it was all like big push for the, really bright neon colors and they offered it everywhere and he was you know a lot of shops had it so there was that and then there was the Burton stuff and uh I don't remember like I don't remember there being snowboard specific outerwear quite yet maybe there was a little bit starting to come out I think the snowboard shop crew was getting some early stuff that was made uh in Calgary whether it was like gimbal aware or gimbal, like there was definitely some stuff that was coming out, but there was no, there wasn't really much as far as snowboard specific outerwear. It was, it was kind of whatever you had, but there also wasn't that many snowboarders on the mountain. Like there was a very small crew. I, I grew up um, riding in Kimberly um, and at the local resort, it happened to be, you know, it was myself and a few of my friends, similar age. And then there was a few older guys who were like those older skateboarders that had picked it up the year prior um, that were the good guys. Like, so, but it was a very small crew. You go up on the hill and um, you couldn't get away with doing anything. If we were like building jumps or, you know, any anything you did, they knew who you were because it wasn't like now where you go up and there's snowboarders everywhere. It was, there's the group of snowboarders. Um, you need to, you know, I think we had to get our, our tickets punched and we were only allowed on the T-bar at first. So we had to make sure that we were like, we could ride the T-bar, which in Kimberly was it's a big, long, steep face on the first bit of the T-bar. So if you could make it up the T-bar, then you're pretty set. It sucked. Um, and then, yeah, someone would, from the ski school would follow you down. And I think it was like they'd laminate a little you know, colored dot on your pass or punch it or something. But it was a, a bit of a process to actually be allowed to snowboard. But they were allowing us to be on the mountain. And then that very quickly went to, you know, all all consumed. Every, every bit of every... Uh, you know, a very good group of people that all we wanted to do was be on the mountain. So, yeah, if we could convince our parents to bring us up, there was night skiing in Kimberly, we'd be like at the mountain every day we could from the time we get there till they closed and turn the lights off. And every weekend from nine in the morning till they closed the lifts, it was just all consuming group of people that were all hyper focused on this, you know, at the time. What? Very new to us, which obviously wasn't super new, but it was just kind of hitting. So. What individuals made this so ca captivating to you? Was it more marketing that got you like really excited with the snowboarding or was did you actually have like <laughs> you mentioned Craig Kelly already but yeah. there's a there's a whole group. It's like did you have a favorite and like how did like who was the impact back then that was like ooh snowboarding looks sick cuz you said at the beginning that you're just like holding on and just going straight down the hill yeah. and just bailing down the hill which most of us that's how we start. Yeah, and you know and thinking to that time it, I think, you know, with the first time that I ever had that wooden board out, it, there was no thought in my head that there was anything more to it than it was this, there was this thing that you could order and try out and it was like a sled. Everyone had a sled. So I don't think I ever thought of it as being something that people all over North America with snow were doing. Yeah. It was just kind of like, oh, cool. Like that, you can stand up on that sled. Like that wasn't, I don't think there was anything in my head at that point that was like, Did you know that you had Craig Kelly's board? And did you know who Craig Kelly was? At or you, that like, time, I did, afterwards. Okay. So so there's a story to that. Um, there, When I went to go, like, you know, had the Kemper, rode it for a season, had some a few close friends in Cranbrook and Kimberly that we grew up with, and like I said, spent every weekend on the hill anytime we could. But it was a very small crew of us. But obviously, a few of those people had been able to, like, you know, go on trips with their parents or go somewhere and, like, bring back gear they'd be like oh what's that board you know and i think you started seeing like uh you know there was the barfoots and there was the burton and very few sims at the time but like there was boards that were propping up we're like what's up with that same time as when you know magazines start hitting and you're getting infatuated and it was like you knew the magazines would be delivered on you know wednesdays and sundays where anybody like run down the street every wednesday after school and look at the magazine rack to see if there was some new because it was uh, at the time, International Snowboard Magazine was a was like kind of the mag. It was what you would go for. Um, and all of a sudden, you're opened up to like, wow, there's there's way more to this. Look at this. There's like contests, and there's you know, because there was no internet, so your everything that you got was from either the local skateboard shop that might have brought in some snowboards, 
or somebody saw somebody or whatever. So you got you got this magazine and you're like, whoa, there's guys doing this in California. And, oh, there's oh, there's Canadians doing this. And you'd have heard stories of like, you know, the snowboard shop was already, you know, involved in Calgary. And that was the closest thing to us was the snowboard shop. So that was where we kind of gravitated to. Anytime we could, it would be like trip to Calgary to go to the snowboard shop because they had everything. And that was like the hub of where we were for snowboarding. Um, and I think the world outside of that got very real when like, there's like world champions, there's this, there's, and it was like way bigger than we thought, but no one, it was still small, you know, like it was still, you'd go to a different resort and you had friends immediately because you'd be riding and be like, Hey, there's some other snowboarders. And it would do, you do everything you could to go meet them because obviously they're going to be your friends because they're the only snowboarders on the mountain. So would you know, yeah, that's you found <laughs> you found like it's really funny to say because it's not I don't feel like there are ever I feel really lucky that we got to be in that era because it was I literally like we'd we went to Fernie and all of a sudden there was like a few more guys on snowboards. Oh, who are they? And then we went somewhere else and then we and you'd meet these people that were like, there's more people doing this. It's not just us. It was just very quickly becoming this thing where there was like way more to it. And there was equally in every community as many kids or adults whoever at the time that were equally as passionate about this new thing that just wanted nothing to do but that um and then yeah so craig kelly uh influential wise is huge because there was so much media in the magazines and everything about you know craig and i mean there was other guys involved too but he was like the world champion he was the guy that was getting all this stuff and i think the um the tie to all that was we went down, I went back to the same shop I had gotten the Kemper from the year before. I went back down and, and it was like, I needed, I needed to have this Craig Kelly board. Um, and just so happened that we went down to this shop, Lulu's it's called in Spokane. Uh, I think it's probably still there. And Craig Kelly was there because he had just won the, uh, world championship, uh, again. Anyway. Yeah. So in I go and, Craig's there signing autographs, right? Which is, is like, oh, I'm a starstruck kid. And there's Craig Kelly. He's like got the poster of him wearing his red and yellow suit. Like I just bought a pop swatch, big thick banded, you know, and there I was, I was in Lulu's and Craig Kelly signed a poster for me and signed my watch. And Where is that poster? I still have it. No oh, yeah. way. I still have the pop swatch as well, actually. <laughs> Yes. Well, I do somewhere. Uh, yeah, it went missing a little while ago, but I'm I'm hopeful that we'll find it in the move here. But yeah, I've I've kept those both those things. Um, and again, that was prior to me, you know, becoming this like snowboard history nerd and like being this involved. That was the start of it all, right? So it was like that was my tie, and it gave me. It was like we were already so hyper hyper focused on snowboarding, but that in itself was just like, wow, this guy's like he's signing autographs. Like this is a huge thing. It just became larger than life, and it was like you started to hear about all these other people that were involved, right? Who were some of the others? At that point, um, well, we knew a lot about... So we were getting, like, the news feed from Calgary, basically. So, like, Ken and the original snowboard shop crew, it was, like, John Boyer, and and there was uh, Don Schwartz, and Mike, there was all these, like, Canadian guys that were involved, uh, and then we were getting some... Uh, Steve Matthews was another guy, Um there was like this Team Extreme thing going on where there was a bunch of guys there. And then we were also getting uh, information from, a lot of the stuff was coming out of like California, right? We were hearing about Kidwell. We were hearing about Palmer. We were hearing about, I can't even remember who it would have been at the time. It's going to be like a mishmash of Did things. But it was like Chris Roach, all these yeah. people, right? And and I think, um, I think at that time it didn't matter who it was. It was just like, you just were like hunting for whatever, um, whatever information you could find, whatever photos, there was like really not much for video. I think the first like video I legitimately ever saw was at the public library. And if I remember correctly, it's called This Is This Is Snowboarding or This This Is Snowboarding with Team Sims or Snowboarding with Team Sims VHS tape of like Sims team at the time doing things, you know, like <laughs> super basic. I think they were like, I think Tom was wearing like stretchy pants in it and stuff like, but we were like, oh, man look at this um but yeah just you were just you would be searching for stuff like i said it was like magazines were hitting the shelves and it started to become this thing but it was still small enough that you were anywhere you went you were like kind of finding friends and it was you you had those ties to like guys like oh there's these canadian guys out of calgary that were 
pro model with barfoot and there's this and there's all these guys that were like doing all these things but it was very slow on the media end of things because you weren't getting any news about anything that was happening till like month, a year months later, later right yeah. like many months later it's not like now but it was just enough to keep you know sparking that and then you know we got friends that got their driver's license and we started traveling up to alberta and you're meeting like the, the guys at lake louise and there's you know the guys at calgary and the guys at sunshine and all of a sudden there's guys popping up everywhere right and it's it's still a very small community of guys so you just you're just buddies all over the place um you know some of those some of those guys i met early on on those first trips are like guys that have been my friends for life like, and it was all based on the fact that we were up you know wherever we were snowboarding and all you know, there's some other snowboarders and then now you have a place to stay it's like, the landscape you're going to calgary and you're staying there and then you're going to wow you know i met i met some like amazing people like going up we used to go up to calgary to do contests because they were you know there was no no contest or anything where we were so we go up to calgary because they had a snowboard community and it'd be like meeting like you know and at my time it was like mike michael chuck and mike astola and like there was like this crew of calgary guys and they're just like you instantly got a bunch of buddies in calgary that are all doing the same thing you are you're just going up to have fun and you know, you'd compete, you'd go up and party for the weekend and go snowboarding. And then when you wanted to go back to Calgary, you could call those guys and you could sleep on the floor. You'd go, and, you know, and then we'd spend summers, like, you know, I spent a few summers, we'd, you know, somehow convince somebody to rent us a place in Whistler. And it was like coming out and staying for the summer, trying to sneak onto the lift to go up and poach camp. And, you know, none of us could really afford to go to camp. So it was just like, public but we just try to sneak on and i think ken kind of let us a lot, a lot of the times there was some tie in i don't know we got up but yeah really cool time to be uh, involved in it because you could just you you kind of had so many people that were constantly for me um, looking back on it it's it's uh, i think we chatted about it earlier but um it uh the hyper focus but having people to give you that positive reinforcement you know i uh I found out in the last few years I'm like fairly autistic ADHD spectrum, um, which I never knew because growing up and having early on this focused drive of being able to have that one thing that I just wanted to do all the time um, and not feeling weird about it because I surrounded myself with other people that were like equally as, you know, driven it's like a brotherhood it was a full yeah your tribe right you find your tribe it's like yeah so there was nothing strange about it at the time it was just like we're all doing this this is great and and i was able to like meander through that and and find so many friends and and travel and do all this cool stuff not knowing because i had kind of made my way through school pretty easily and and was never presented in any way that i thought i was you know, any different than anybody else or thought any differently but you know, many years later in life, I figured it out. But like, I've I've uh, spent you know a huge chunk of my life. I'm old, <laughs> thirty. Or, uh, I don't know how many years now. But following this sport that led me to be able to have this lifestyle where I was, you know, it started off just being able to snowboard and travel, and then it was like, oh, I I had a, met a friend that was going to New Zealand for the summer, and this uh, unfortunately passed away. Uh, buddy Pete Navin. That was we met him competing in Banff and through a friend of a friend, hey, he's going to go spend the summer in New Zealand. And I was like, what a better way to spend a summer. going to go snowboarding in New Zealand. And didn't know him that well, but like cold called him up. He was working at Rude Boys in Banff at the time. And was like, hey, like, I heard you're going to New Zealand. Our, we had a mutual friend, I think. I don't know how it happened at the time. I think somehow tied to like silence. Remember silence snowboards? Yeah, I do. And I wish I could remember the guy's name. But he's like, yeah, you should go meet up with Pete. He's going too. So cold called him like, yep, yeah, here's a travel agent. You should come with us. Cool. Did that stuff stress you out? Like the fact that you would have to make this call to somebody or you felt like snowboarding, the bond between everybody was so strong that you could just call somebody. Yeah, randomly. there was no, I don't think there was any stress involved at that. It was Does the a, outside world give you more like, if, like, do you get I more th stressed out working with people that were outside of snowboarding? I'm just wondering. Did I the think, I think that it's a good question because again, at the time, I don't think I, I, uh, I really thought about that too much. Because I had come out of, you know, school where you have very little, like, there's nothing really that you need to, like, school, school. But you don't really have anything that's stressing you out at school. When you enter the real world and you need a job and have to start paying for rent and everything, you start to see some effects of the outside world because your parents have, like, kept you fairly sheltered, right? Like, you're safe and contained. Um, 
So I think that initially, all my focus was was on snowboarding, and I had met uh, Pete and a few other really great people up in Banff when we were competing with. So it was like I talked to them, we'd seen them, like we'd snowboarded together. We weren't at that point weren't friends, right? It was just like a sideline buddy. Um, but it was a tie to an industry and a connection to go here, and and it was like it was that kind of a community at that time too, right? You, it was like it didn't matter who was who. You could go. If, if we saw somebody coming into town and we were like, hey, well, you need a place to stay, come crash out. Like There was no no problem. It was just, you could easily go somewhere and find somebody that was a snowboarder and you could, you know, your house is my house coming in. And parents were like easy at that time, right? You got a friend staying over, cool. That's the best thing it about was, skateboarding and snowboarding. It's the one industry or the one thing that I got obsessed with where it was the first thing where I had friends like when I was like 13 that were like 21 yeah. and like, I couldn't drive, but like Somebody a 20 could. year old would drive into my parents' driveway and pick me up to go skateboarding or yeah. go snowboarding. And my parents are at first were like, what the hell's going on here? I'm like, you don't get it. Like this guy's the best and we're homies. Yeah. And why are you hanging out with that 13 year old? You weird. It's like, no, it's just like this special community yeah. that embraces. Like It was, it was. And, and you don't think about that till years later, but yeah, it was, I didn't have any, any problem making that call. I don't think. And then you know, fast forward a couple months later, I'd like did everything I could to raise money. I went tree planting every summer for to put money in the bank, and then I would mess off to either come to you know whether it was camp or I went to New Zealand off and on. Spent many years down there, um, but yeah, showed up to you know you should come to Calgary. It's my old man's fiftieth or whatever. You know, it was like I showed up a few days early before we went to fly to New Zealand to stand at a house of this guy that I didn't really know that well that I was going to go then spend months with traveling and snowboarding in New Zealand. So that I could hang out while his dad had his 50th and we went and party. Like it was just like, it was that kind of a community, right? Um, and he was the one that convinced me in the end. We're a couple months deep in, in New Zealand and he's like, you should move to Banff. I'm like, that's great. Such a good crew of snowboarders. And at that point, I didn't really know what I was going to do. It was, uh, I think I had plans to, if I remember correctly, I think I had plans that I thought about coming out to Whistler at that point. And then this happened and I was like, cool. There was a lot of good... You know, if you think back to the early days, uh, the Banff days, there was like a really solid crew of guys that were already in Banff that all were like part of that original snowboard shop skaters posse, um, quite larger than life characters like Greg Todd's and Taylor Piercy and you know, like early Newsom, like all these these guys that were like, man, they're shredding. Right. So and those guys all ended up leaving. They like. <laughs> They all pieced out and came to I gotta say, the fucking like, Banff, like Lake Louise borders that I've met over the years, like shredding is a great word to describe those individuals because they fucking rip yeah. the mountain. They rip all of the mountain the park, the rocks, the pillows, the jumps, the step downs, the powder. And the whole time, I'm like, you know when the, the beauty and like chaos when somebody's just on the line of keeping it together because yeah. they're going so savagely fast and just ripping that's what i think about when i think of because that was like the first place i went to when i was like leaving whistler and i'd go to banff and i'd see how people would board there and i'm like yeah. these guys are fucking psychos like jonas dustin yeah. Yeah. andrew sorry for yeah so kind no of that's but that's the thing is that was the next like you're speaking to guys who so those guys came up like uh, rewind it a bit, but like, you know, I'm in Kimberly and uh, if you've ever been to Kimberly, it's a pretty tame, it's like a family resort, rolling groomers, like super fun to go fast. But we grew up with a good crew of guys there that were just like, anytime we could get a ride or have a car, or whatever, we'd go hiking in the, you know, Samuel Creston or we'd go to Nelson or we'd go to Fernie. We started seeing that there was like, you could ride snowboards fast in the trees and there's deep pow and you know, eye opening. And then you go out the first trip out to Lake Louise and all of a sudden you're like, you know, Fernie's a pretty awesome mountain. But the first time you're in, in Alberta and all of a sudden you go up a lift and you're like, holy crap, like there's big Alpine and big, you know, and it's like, and you see those guys and they're just like fast, like riding so fast and so powerful. <laughs> and just like that next crew, right? Those are the guys that were like the older guys when we started going to Alberta contests that they were the older guys. And they were like, those guys were the guys. You just wanted to try to snowboard with them or try to keep up to them at that point. Um, and those guys, like I said, they moved on and, and went to do some of the huge things, right? Um, but that was kind of, you know, a, a very big thing of seeing how um, how much people were progressing so quickly. The sport was progressing. People were doing bigger things. Bannock was there at the time, too. Like, 
you know, I'm telling you, like larger than life characters that were given a platform because it was this sport that was like, it was kind of loud. It was loud. It was obnoxious. Guys were riding massive pants. And, you know, it went from being neon to being like, you know, this like chain wallets and Let's talk about that era, that era so and stuff, sick. Man. Like the Chris Roach kind of, yeah. Nate Cole, like that whole, yeah, like Wes Makepeace, like yeah. Tweaky. Dude, Wes and Wes, that was like, before I even knew Wes, like I, I heard about Wes through other friends that had left Kimberly and lived in, uh, actually in Rosalind. And Wes was in Rosalind. Um, we heard about him. Oh, this guy, Wes. He's like, and I remember being in Rosalind and like going up, I don't know what chair it's called. It was super sketchy for us at the time, but one of the chairs is pretty steep, you know, and we're going up with our buddy and, and it was that thing. That was like my introduction to knowing who Wes was and knowing that there was like other guys and other places doing things that we had heard about or seen in, you know, Lake Louise or whatever. But it was like going up the lift and watching this guy that was just like riding way faster than anybody I'd ever seen. You know, we all like maybe thought we were pretty good snowboarders at that point. And then you're like, holy crap, like, oh yeah, that's Wes. <laughs> You know, and I think he was riding like an aggression board that was probably like a 180 or something. Like, I don't even know what it was. <laughs> Maybe it was a with 170. Like a, with the gun but like, on the bottom? I don't think it was. No, that was a Tark one. Oh, okay. He had a different one. Tark one's board before that blue one with the gun. Like, I think the year prior. And But they all, all the big ones ended up getting brought a to shop. A 180? I don't know how I mean, big West it was, man. Huge, I, I want to say, I want to say though, it was probably like at least a 170 or 168. Like, it was a big board. Uh, and I think at the t it had a nail on it. It was a great, yeah, man. It was like, it was, I think it was Tarquin's board prior to the shotgun, but they were big. But anyway, sideline to that. Wes was a machine already. And then I don't know when he left Rosalind, but I just remember we never got to ride with him because we, there's no way we could have kept up to him at that point. But I've heard rumors seeing him and was, then just being like, holy shit, man. <laughs> I heard rumors he was one of the hardest to, to film. But all the media back in the day would be like they wanted to film him, but it would be hard for him just to like show up. But when he did, it was just like the best snowboarders here, like all the cameras were on him. But it was just so hard for for him to show up because yeah. he just didn't give a fuck. Like, yeah. And maybe that's it, too. Right? I don't know. <laughs> which is but which that goes era, back to the baggy chains. Like that and was that's the vibe. it. It's like we, you know, like I'll give you a story about the, the chain wallet united stands like again i'm still we haven't left cranbrook yet we're like cranbrook kimberly kids like only getting our snowboard media from like occasional trips to calgary to the snowboard shop or picking up the magazine so there's like this change of like man there's these boards but you're going from like you know 18 inch stances and like cant plates and like craig kelly man like knees together and all of a sudden it's like oh people wanted their board shorter they're like i i was in shop class i became like the local board reshaper because I loved wood shop and my wood shop teacher was like do whatever you want on lunch break and I was getting you know all my buddies that had these you know pretty crappy boards because they were like old school too long too heavy big huge noses whatever and it was like they'd take a jiffy marker and a you know whatever some kind of container and mark it I want to cut there and like just destroying I mean at the time it was what you did but yeah cutting everything got cut down like oh we can spin better if there's not enough you know more less nose and you're you're cutting off like three quarters of the kick at the nose because it didn't matter about powder at that point everyone wanted to like you're starting to see these guys like t-nutting their boards and you know 25 inch stances and no high backs and just like it's changed like, the game's changed there's no more neon it's like oversized clothes like i said chain wallets we show up to fernie for this it was called the fernie frenzy i think skaters sports shop put it on notorious fernie every time there's a contest there for snowboarding in the early 90s it would snow so we show up to this half pipe contest that i think was just a way so that jerry and the guys from skaters could come and party and hang out in fernie for the weekend with their crew and there isn't really a half pipe at that time either there's no cutters so it was like hand shape you come the day before with shovels and like hand shape this like pushed up walls kind of <laughs> really funny to say man it's really funny um but you know it was like and those are the guys it was greg todd's and and Taylor and Lay was like, there was a big crew of guys from Calgary at that point. Um, Derek Height, I think, would have been coming out at that point. Pretty young Derek Height before he had moved out. And um, like I said, yeah, who knows who else would have come down. But you show up to Fernie and it snows. So this this pipe that you're supposed to shape the day prior, like, probably didn't get shaped that well. Everyone had some drinks or whatever they were doing. And then it dumped snow. And then there's like, you're supposed to have this contest and this pow. But I remember rolling in there and being like, it's dumped all night and we're supposed to do this half pipe contest. And we all like committed to doing it anyway, but let's go ride, you know? And I remember coming in and sides, you know, coming down to where the half pipe was and it was Bannock 
they had Bannock on the mic, and he was just mocking people for tiny stances and high backs and like grabbing their boards. Like I specifically remember him be like, oh, look at this guy doing another spinny board grab thing. Cause it was like all about the, like late spins and just steezed out, no shifty grabs boat. and shifties. It was like, that was the time and we had no idea. Right. But I think in that weekend, like pretty much every one of my buddies from Cranbrook or Kimberly were like, I don't know how it ended up happening, but like, I don't know if it was Greg or Bannock or somebody, but like we all ended up with our boards t nutted and like bindings were t- like high backs were gone. Like everything, <laughs> we just all turned into this. Like, oh, it's got to be the way to do it. These guys are Bannock's doing it. on the mic yeah. the next day. You're like, no high backs. Fuck yeah. those. Not stands. grabbing my snowboard T-bolded. anymore. You know, like, yeah. But that was kind of, that was it, right? It was just changing so quickly and it was allowing these people to be larger than life at this sport that was like, pretty new and you know you're still getting skiers like whacking you with their poles in the line and telling you like it was that and it people like it's funny to say now but like yeah man there was like a lot of that maybe in the lift line people like yelling at you scraping the snow off our hill like smacking you with their poles but then like if someone smacked west make piece with a pole yeah i don't know yeah yeah, exactly and again it's 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 also like the timeline (laughs) of my age and where i was right like it was like i'm sure there was probably some scuffles that i never even knew about because i was like in that younger age um but yeah everything was just changing super quick but um that was it there was there was a lot of characters developing in the sport even just around my small part of the community the you characters know, are what and, fucking drew me in yeah i love and characters. and i think that's it right and then you start hearing about other people like you know being in kimberly close to nelson we like we started hearing about sheen campos we started hearing about like guys like wes you hear about these guys at different places that are pretty close to where you are and then and then you start seeing like oh they got photos coming out and then there's this and then it's like all of a sudden there's like people everywhere and it was it it was all so quick but just the comedy routine and partying and everything it was fun yeah that's but yeah gave and like uh, going full circle we're going back to the same question is like it it allowed me uh a focus because you always were surrounded by people that were just equally as stoked to go snowboarding so through the years the original crew i grew up snowboarding with whether it was like because they didn't want to snowboard or they they worked more or they didn't follow like you know i left school and immediately moved to Banff and started, you know, pursuing more things. I just wanted to snowboard. I moved to Banff because Pete introduced me to this guy, Rob Stevens, who's like another like legendary Canadian dude. He used to be like rad guide, hosted the Olympics commentary. <laughs> he was the like first Olympics dude that made the comment about McDonald's. Remember that? No. no Stevens was my first boss in, in, uh, in Banff. It was awesome. He, was he was comment? a commentator for CBC or C, whoever the Olympics sports were for the first year, like the Nagano Olympics. So he was the he was the sports guy for snowboarding for the Nagano Olympics and you know obviously the blow up with Ross and everything to do with weed and whatever else right it was a big deal back then oh totally first man. snowboarder like, to get a uh, medal first whatever Terry not doing it it was, was Terry not there no he was not that no, wasn't Terry that because there was no pipe was there Nagano yeah because it was a it was a uh, it was a display sport or whatever right the first ones but anyway so Rob. Uh, I'll just remember it because I know Robin, I think it's still think it's one of the funniest things ever. He's, he's commentating about everything. And then obviously he's the sports guy for snowboarding. So they're interviewing him about, you know, what do you think about Ross losing his medal because he had banned substance and Rob's like prime time Olympic hosting, you know? And he goes, yeah, saying that weed is performance enhancing is like saying McDonald's is good for you. <laughs> and like, <laughs> Not probably thinking of the big picture, the fact that like McDonald's is like one of the biggest sponsors of the Olympic broadcast, right? So I think that might have been the end of his like <laughs> commentating with CBC. Anyway, yeah. Uh, but again, he was one good. of the OG guys that was out here in Whistler back in the day and um, ran Cassie, which, which uh, so he ran the instructor's program in uh, Norquay at Banff. So I moved up to Banff. He hired me as an instructor. And pretty much immediately realized that I didn't actually really want to be an instructor. I just just I just needed a job. Um, and for a few years prior, um, I had been riding along with the snowcat drivers in Kimberley uh, because again they knew who you were because you were a snowboarder. We were always getting in trouble for building jumps on the hill, and there was a cool spot in Kimberley you could jump off the lift when it snowed, and we all did, and then got ratted on, and then the ski patrol found us, and so like those of us snowboarders that jumped off the lift, and we all got pulled into the. Patrol shack, long story. 
we had one really great ski patrol there that was like, why don't you guys like band together? You want jumps? Like we should do jumps. And I was like, wow, we'd do that. We just need to ride with the cat drivers. Not really thinking at the time it would work out. And this guy, Bruce, another, he was my tree planting boss, actually. He's like, who let me fuel my snowboarding for years. Um, he was like, okay, well, let's make it happen. And we ended up meeting with the hill and they, I was like, this would be a great spot to build jumps. And the hill ended up like kind of allowing me to spearhead working with the cat drivers and Kimberly to start building jumps on this section of the hill and doing ride alongs with them. And so I'm a young kid, like spending evenings riding along with these old cat driver dudes. And one of them is a great dude that I, and as they're doing it, we're teaching me basically. And so I never drove one in Kimberly, but I'd be at the shop while they're starting them up and learning where all the grease points are and learning how to warm up the engine and what the blade controls were. I'd, I'm infatuated with machinery. So I moved to Banff and I'm instructing, but not really instructing, just getting the minimum pay. And uh, the guy that at the time was doing the pipe in Banff, I got caught falling asleep on the job, I think. like, And I had been like talking to the managers of the hill about trying to get involved with building park and driving cat, but didn't really have an in. And all of a sudden I got called into the, to the office there. Um, Pat Cote, I think his name was, that owned the hill at the time. And they're like, yeah, we hear that you're wanting park. You like want to get into the cat and do this. They're like, do you think you could do it? And I was like, yeah, certainly I could. I've, I've been riding around for years. I haven't driven one. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go up to the shop. And it was like, walked up to the shop at Norquay and went inside. And the head mechanic was like, ran me through some basics. Like, well, there's, you got to learn. So if you've been riding along, you should know where the grease points are. And yeah, I knew where the grease points were. I knew how to start up the cat. I knew how to idle it. Knew a lot of the things already. Obviously knew nothing at that point Real in reality. But basically, they're like, well, your first your first uh, order of business is trying to pull this cat out of the shop without hitting a wall. You know, like, oh, great. So out of the, yeah, ma manage that. I don't know how either at this point. But yeah, and, and then that started uh, another full pursuit of like full snowboard nerding. I was like, oh, all of a sudden I was in a snow cat. And it was early on. And, you know, the only things really happening, Alberta was really positive with half pipes at the time. Um, there was half pipes almost everywhere, and Norquay was one of the first uh, first resorts that actually brought Doug Waugh up with the pipe dragon to do a pipe. A couple times a year, we'd get it cut by Doug. He would tow it up from Colorado, and they would build because there was only one at the time, right? So Doug would tow it up with a trailer, do COP. He would do, you know, Norquay, <laughs> and it would get cut. You like know. a fucking carnival. Yeah, like twice a year, <laughs> you'd have a pipe that was cut by the guy that designed the machine, and other than that, it was garbage, right? But. So they were the, one of the first resorts that actually bought a pipe dragon. So my first year uh, at Norquay, I went from, you know, casually not wanting to be an instructor and was kind of given a good opportunity to not do that as much as I could from Rob, who we would just go snowboarding all the time <laughs> as my boss. And then uh, and then started started into the snowcats. And it was like they it was it was amazing because they have super cold weather, crazy snowmaking, and they were really quite progressive forward thinking in park stuff so they were truthfully like kind of letting me do my own thing the Damn. the head safety guy there at first was like you know you can't build jumps too big and and that became something early on that was like well you know like it's they're almost safer when they're a little bigger because if you build the jump too close to the landing people overshoot the landing and get hurt and it took a little while and then I think one night I just went out and this is again part of my like I'm just going to prove people wrong and and, you know, one of those things with my brain. I think I built something a little bigger than I should have and at first got in trouble, but then was like, just watch. Like, it's not going to hurt people. And then from that point on, they were like, okay, you obviously have a grasp of what people want. And they just kind of let me go to town. And it was, it's been a few years working for Norquay and, and, you know, kind of at the time honing my skills, building parks. Um, but then was able to take that because I was still snowboarding. Um, I was able to take that to... Uh, other places because they're like oh all these other guys at these resorts are old cat drivers that want nothing to do with they building jumps it. they don't, they don't want it. to cut a pipe and so all of a sudden I was like oh that's like that could be a business so I dumb as I was like just like I'm gonna start a business and started a business and started saying oh I've got this Phoenix Snowpark Designs I'm gonna do it. and it, at the time I think Steve Petrie was out in Whistler he was like their full-time park guy um, but really there was no one else doing that and all of a sudden that opened up all these doors where I was like, oh, can you come, you know, uh, build for the Vans Triple Crown? Can you come to Japan to build a park for this Japan Winter Sports School? Oh, we're going to go to Nor Norway. So all of a sudden I was like traveling. I got to snowboard. I got to hang out with my buddies. I was building jumps. I was getting paid like better than I would have if I was just at the resort grooming. You know, I was like, this is the best thing ever. I'm traveling around the world, getting to 
hang out and and then uh i've always i was always involved i always loved photos and video and stuff so i i don't know what how i got involved in that either but i was like oh i'll just carry a camera like i'm i'm doing this stuff anyway and i started taking photos because i was building for events snowboard canada that was it the snowboard canada jam tours that was a big opener for me too um so i was traveling with them being like the head of their events uh for building so we did big airs uh border cross big airs and half pipe contests and they had like quebec Alberta, and then it ended up turning into the uh, West Beach, basically turned into one for the last couple of years. You know, but that opened a lot of doors because I was getting to work with these events, still get to snowboard on the side, and I was hanging out with all my buddies who were like oh, way better snowboarders than I ever was. So it was just a way for me to stay involved. Um, and then I was there anyway, so I was like, oh, I'm going to take photos. So I, I was like building parks, getting travel the world, and then I was like had a camera in my hand all the time, so I started taking photos. <laughs> It all kind of was all spurred on through the same thing. It was just like I had this huge love of snowboarding and was like at the same time uh, super into the history. And I don't know why that tied in early. It was just like I'd be traveling and be like, oh, look at that old piece of crap. It's a crazy board. And I just like see my garage sales and I'm going to buy that. And it became this like kind of obsessive thing where I was just like, like I was saying to you today, man, I couldn't even drive by the reuse it on the way into town without pulling in and crossing to see what was on the fence. Because and you got a Burton 7. I did, yeah, like a minty <laughs> Burton 7. I Thank you to whoever put that out at the, at the reuse it. It's a pretty sweet piece. But um, Let's touch yeah, on the yeah. riders that got you into, like, you, you went through, um, you know, you got in the snowcat, you picked up the lens, um, and I think that we can talk on some of the major events that you were part of snowcatting, but, like, as far as early on photography goes, who were, like... Who are you shooting on in the early days that kind of like boosted your career? You're like, I was shooting these individuals and kind of got put on the map. I think um, the the early on uh, kind of the breakover of the, with the cat work into snowboarding stuff um, probably would have started. It was all based around the like the guys in Alberta that were there, you know, the whole time so it would have been uh like i think when i first got out there you know you got to think like renzi was like a 10 year old kid when i first moved to Banff, right and uh jonathan was there and he was like a little older and um there's the the next kind of group of of the bigger you know big end guys it was like scott gaffney navin um uh hardingham Right. Like that whole crew of guys where it was like, oh, I'm just going to I'm going to take photos of these guys off these jumps we built. And it was like and then, you know, that just kept happening where it was like those guys were there. And then, you know, there was always the next guys. Did Hardingham like, always have that big of a personality? Dude, yeah, man, he's pretty like, a, I mean, you know what? I say that I'm like, it's I'm, like I said, I'm old. Um, he's always had a, he He was always a personality for sure. I think I think Hardingham is one of the smartest um smartest businessmen like snowboarders that i've met um he i think really early on figured out that he didn't have to follow the same route as everybody he didn't have to leave banff and move to whistler um and i think i remember him saying he was like well if everyone that's awesome leaves to whistler they're all fighting with the other awesome guys in whistler to try to get the coverage he's like if i'm in banff and and i'm making sure that i get coverage then i'm the guy in banff getting you know and it's it worked it um, worked really it well. It worked. And he not just the personality, man. The guy is like... He's a savage. He's a savage. And he he's one of those guys that... I don't know how many times. Like, I shot with him a lot, man. But it, it's like one of those guys that... There's a uh, handful of people that you can go out with and never really know what you're going to get yourself into. Um, and also be somewhat scared of like stuff. And he was one of those guys. Because, oh, I got this thing. I'm going to do this. And you'd be like, okay. Like, there's a lot of rocks there. You know, and... Yeah, no problem. Like, I'm invincible. Yeah, like that was his thing. I'm invincible, and he was like he just did stuff. But yeah, he I think as his as his uh, career uh, developed and he was changing, he morphed. He like changed his his he had a persona and he he developed the persona onto like hey wanted to do these skits and wanted to you know look at some of the skits videos and stuff that he did. Man, the guy's like the most fun guy to hang out with. Like so many good times hanging out with that guy and just like he's always on his own program. He just does what he wants and. It's cool. He's he's he was able to navigate uh, through the world of professional snowboarding, do these trips everywhere, became like this name that everyone kind of knows. And it wasn't just because he was like a, 
incredibly talented. No worry. Like he was a personality. Oh, and yeah. he was one of the early guys that knew that, that that was a selling feature, right? Like it's, you want to, you want to have a career that lasts. You can't just be super good on your snowboard. And I think he had people in front of him that probably helped to show him that, you know, there's a lot of, man, there was like so many talented snowboarders coming out of Alberta. Um, and the ones that did really well were generally the ones that were like good in front of a camera and good. Look at his prodigy, Dustin good, Craven. Good party. You know what I mean? <laughs> Dustin is That's, such a prodigy yeah, of fucking, yeah. And if in you, a way. Yeah, he, yeah, it is. And and Dustin, uh, to his own, man, that guy is like, he, he, he like I said, incredibly talented kid. And um, watching him go from, you know, the young kid in Calgary, half pipe, whatever he was doing, and then kind of come into Banff for a couple of years and pull in some of that Hardingham flair and do those trips and have that personality and like, love it or hate it there was you know probably some things that you know you're a teenager doing whatever he started but he's got skills right like and it works it's just like he 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 navigated that the way he kind of wanted to and then look where he is now man it's just like he kind of went through all that and still came out on the other end where he's you know there's some people that were like maybe doubting that he should be snowboarding and all of a sudden he's like oh yeah <laughs> look at this like yeah. you're just like and there's no doubt like he's just like he loves snowboarding and he's just that i think that that uh proving ground of of that alberta scene with the it's not whistler it's not like deep snow stuck to rocks it's like dicey snow barely covered shark's tooth like you when you're good at landing and you're good at finding lines and stuff in that kind of rocky snowpack that's why i think a lot of those guys can come out somewhere like here or other places around and just be like, I'm going to go off of that and not have any concerns because they're like, what's like, I don't, I don't, who cares? There's no rocks under that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so it just gives them that level of confidence to do things that are, are kind of a bit nutty. Um, but yeah, so to answer your question, those guys um, definitely started things for me. And then um, I got really lucky. I think uh, Hardingham would have introduced me to uh, Sansalone and Keenan's and like that crew through the skids crew that used to come up to Banff quite a bit. Um, and that's what started pulling me towards the coast. I was like Banff for a long time and I was only there. I'd be in uh, summers in Banff or winters in Banff. And then I started doing, uh, there was a, a resort in New Zealand snow park. That was like park only pretty cool spot for a number of years. And so I was like bouncing. I'd be in Banff and then I'd go to New Zealand and then I'd come back to Banff and go to New Zealand. And, um, and then I was coming back in Banff and doing these events. So I was leaving. I wasn't full-time anymore working for Norquay. I had actually left and started developing a park program for RCR. So we were doing Lake Louise, Nakiska, Ernie, Kimberly. Like there was a group. Um, so we were like building rails, trying to get parks at each place. But the benefit of that was I was like running events as well. So I was on the road doing all their events work. It was a lot of driving, but I was able to bail. And every time I had time off, I was ending up driving to like Revelstoke or driving out to Whistler to shoot with Sansloan or to shoot with whoever I could shoot with, whether it was guys from Banff that wanted to go road tripping, but I was leaving a lot because it became apparent that it was like, Oh, I want to do this photography thing. Um, and I was really lucky to have a job in uh, parks that was giving me enough money and time that I could like pursue photography. Um, and then there was a point where it was like, man, I'm like, I think the other big contributor to that was um tj uh, oh, and the dude. whole the whole crew in calgary because dude. he opened up uh i want to say like he opened up my uh world of uh advertising photography because he had oh he's a genius yeah and he was great he was like one of those first guys that was like very easy to talk to and did his own marketing and like became that guy that was like i think maybe jay brown was kind of like that a little Jason bit Brown, with him, right? Totally. Like, but I see TJ as like one of the first guys who opened up the doors to being con like anyone could, you could hit him up on whatever platform it was at the time. And he was more than willing to chat with you. Or, oh yeah. He told my friends like the settings he was using for cameras yeah. and like he had a website Yeah, and then like, that's right. Then oh, he's so, done a lot. so what he did for me, um, he was a pioneer. Thanks TJ. A lot of things. Yeah. And it was, so his, his thing that opened my eyes to photography was that he all of a sudden was one of the first, I want to say one of the first guys that I worked with that had like, re like really great sponsor backing. And it was my first time that I saw that like, oh, I've got, you know, TJ's like this guy that everyone wants photos of. 
So, you know, he was writing for Oakley at the time. He was writing for Sessions. Sessions. He was writing for... Capita. I don't know if it was 32 or Deluxe and Capita. He had all these sponsors, and they all wanted advertising photos. Um, And obviously, again, it's a different world now. But back then, you're like selling a double-page ad to a company that's going to put that ad in not just one magazine, but like internationally. And all of a sudden, it was like, oh, what's that worth? And, you know... How much was it worth back then? Like, I think, you know... I wish I could, t- I wish I could remember, but like thousands, right? Like you're selling a, you're selling a single page ad for a couple grand. You're selling a double page ad for more than that. Like it was, a, it was like substantially more money. Um, and even at that, it was nothing compared to what a photographer outside of action sports would have made for that. But at the time I was like, geez, man, like I, I'm going to do everything I can to shoot with TJ and his crew anytime. And they were like great dudes to hang out with. So we were just like, you know, I was having a blast. I was learning, like, made me start shooting differently because it was a lot of street stuff, like setting up flashes, long exposures, doing all these things. And then I introduced through that became like Dwayne Weave and Scotty Shaw and all these other characters that were like equally as great, like dudes that were just such good snowboarders and amazing guys to hang out with. And all of a sudden that, and I think that's what kept me tied to the Alberta for so long was it's just like, man, there's like this whole next generation of guys. And it was like, there was crew out already. Like, you know, Scotty Shaw was out in Whistler and Jonathan was out here. And all these guys that like I'd shot with that I knew from Alberta that moved out. And they're like, there was always a tie to the coast and I kept coming out, but there was all this stuff happening and there was enough behind it that it was exciting and fun. And for me, it was easy because I was like, well, I'm just going to bump up from Banff up to Calgary. I'm going to shoot for the weekend with this crew. And they were all like, they were pumped, right? You know, the first shot I got of Craven, I think was like, he called me up to go bomb drop off a school and his mom showed up and it was like a pretty big drop. I should pull it out. He's like, yeah, I don't know how old he was, but like young. And like I showed up and it was just this like concrete school that he was like, oh, you're in a little pile of snow and there's mom who's there to watch the show. You know, I was like, geez. But yeah, that was kind of, that was it, right? It was, there was just always a continual flux. And I think there, there always will be up there. There's, I mean, it doesn't matter where you're at. There's always going to be a standout crew guys, but you look at the, next gen kids that are coming out of like they're growing up riding at COP. It's like just ridiculous amount of talent. Right. And they've been given those opportunities. And that's one of the, the coolest things I followed that I got to be involved in all that stuff. And then like, I was just darting my way through stuff and I had no idea where it was going to lead. It was just for me again, it's like we were talking about that mental thing of like hyper-focus and not until I was, you know, 45 years old, did I get told that I was like ADHD autistic spectrum and the only thing that kept me not even knowing that was because I guided my way through this like continual career of being given positive feedback for decisions because it was like, oh, this I is think... a great thing. Snowboarding. Everyone loves it. I'm, you know, I'm in a crew. I'm going to take photos. They love it. And it was like, it was easy. It was like, there was never a point where it was, well, this doesn't seem like something I should do for long. I should probably buckle down and get a real job. Like there was never any of that, but it was also, I was never in it because I thought I was going to get rich. It was like, holy crap, I sold an ad. I can go on a big trip now and shoot more photos. Holy crap, I might be able to sell an ad. I should see if I can go to Alaska so I can take more photos. Like, there was never like, I'm going to buy a house. (laughs) It was like, maybe I was stoked I could buy a snowmobile, (laughs) you know, or whatever it was. You're not even thinking that. But yeah, that wasn't it. It was just like, I, I was never really worried. It was like a very long time that I got to live very selfishly, having a life that I was given uh, the ability to it's weird to say, but the ability to not stress about spending more than what I had in the bank for eight months and then four months working to recover that so that I could do it again. You know, there was never, it was, it was, but it didn't matter. It was just like, it was a loop. And it was like, it was the best thing ever. It was, it was like hanging out with the greatest people, spending time in the mountains with your buddies, meeting these, like getting to go these great places and, and then like being given opportunities, like, getting invited to go build at super park like really i'm gonna get to go build at super park oh you want me to write a sideline blurb for snowboarder mags what like as a kid that was like oh my god you know that was still me at 15 or 16 whatever like you're not gonna write for a snowboarder Mag, you know oh building a jump it, for super park yeah, must like, have been like insane because then yeah you that see, was it like, was you must be proud of yourself you build this jump and then the best in the world are hitting your jump and they go, this jump is fucking sick. It was, it and was the like, photos are dope. Yeah. They're, you know what? It was, it was a very cool, it was, it was cool to, uh, 
it was cool all around. You know, it was cool to be recognized as, especially from Canada. You have like, it's still, it's, I don't know if it's any different. I don't know. There was like a big time where most of the snowboarding world revolved around Southern California. Right? It's not Southern California it's anymore. Utah. It's, it's Utah, Salt Lake City. <laughs> but, you know, for for my generation and a large chunk of, you know, after wash, after my wash is like, it was Southern California. Everyone's like magazines were based there. The brands were based there. The, the totally. cool riders Tahoe. were based there. And, um, and you know, everyone had great parks. And I remember, you know, I got uh, Eric Rosemald. He's still, he's like Park City, I think. too. He's like such a good snowcat operator. And uh, like, and all these guys that are still doing that, which I can't even fathom because you know I don't have that brain to to stick to that stuff for that long. And and uh, anyway, um, but to be recognized in that aspect of like having shot some photos for the magazine, having done these things and being invited to these things, it was like whoa! Like the only place in Canada that had ever been invited to do that is Whistler. And when you look at the the money that flows into a place like Whistler and the support of what the park was even at the time compared to all the other places, whether it's Mammoth or Park City or, you know, Breckenridge or whatever, it's a, it's a tiny amount of money. So, you know, I got given access to this thing where I got uh, asked to interview for a job for, um, oh man, what's the name of the resort? It's outside of, it's not Mammoth. It's, it's another small resort that used to be around. Anyway, long story but got interviewed for like aspen snowmass and park city got these interviews to do park stuff and it was they could never make it happen because i was a canadian i could never get a work visa because as a snowcat operator you're just a machine operator there was never any they can't get you a special permits visa because the the government just goes well anybody can drive a tractor right but in that i got to see and hear from my other buddies who were park builders what their budgets were and I was like, we were running a snowboard park program on the budget of what they got for like a What week. are these budgets? Dude, like at the time it was, I think Park City at the time, say this is like the first time I was really eye-opened. Uh, Jim Magan, I think his name was, a really great photographer too, actually. He was running the program at Park City, I believe. Um, and I wish, I, I can't, I don't quote me on this, but I remember they had the Park City All-Stars at the time. And let's just throw a number out. I say it was a million dollars, whatever. He was given like, like the budget for him to hire a team to promote his park was like 10 times what we had to have our park running at Lake Louise. You know, so it's like when you look at the scale of that and you're like, whoa, we're being invited. Like we're being recognized as having done something that people want to do. And then um, the guys that went on our crew the first year to Breckenridge was... Um, this guy Clayton Carroll, who ran for years, ran the. Uh, he was a, the builder at Nakiska, phenomenal jump builder, really I good snowboarder. That name. Yeah, and um, him and Gunny, I always remember that. Anyways, Gunny. Yeah, Gunny from the from Snow Park Tech. Yeah, yeah. So Clay, Clayton Carroll was like he was. So when I started doing the parks for RCR, Clayton was. Um, I want to say he was like maintenance. He, I forget what he did at nor at Nakiska. And he wasn't being given an opportunity to get in a cat because he was kind of a bit of a, a rebel, whatever it was at the time. And uh, and somehow we got it to the point where I was like, you got to let him in the cat. Like he's a great snowboarder. He wants to do this. And they, on his own merits or on merits with me helping, somehow got him in. And then he was like, leave him. He was like, he built some crazy stuff. Like really amazing. Like probably the best jump line in Alberta at that time and probably since. Like there's, he did a great job. Um, and Nikiska was unknown. It was like, you know, no one goes to Nikiska, but the guys who were going, it was like, he oh, built, he built I knew, himself. I knew Nikiska. Yeah, he just, built himself just... a jump line to go shred every day. And then the boys were like, oh, well, we're going to go to Nikiska. Oh, Nikiska um, had, and they built, Alberta was building huge jumps. And I think that was the, that was another one of the things that la- allowed us to be invited to, um, to do uh, Super Park was that like, I worked for RCR for quite a few years. And then left, and I came back. I had been working for um, for Snow Park, and I was coming back on a winter, and I didn't have anything lined up. And I think I wrote a letter at the time to Charlie Locke. Again, it's like I'm old, so um, I wrote a letter and just said, "Hey, listen, like you guys, you know, not saying they blew it, but I'm like, you know, you guys have this. You've been advertising like we used to advertise like 
longest park in North America. And they did it for years. It was on the brochure. Like they had nothing. And the park they did have, it was like pushed off to this sideline run where they would groom it like once every three weeks. And it was like solid sheet of ice, full diving board takeoffs, like nothing was good. Um, but they were claiming that they had all this stuff. So I was like, Hey, listen, you guys like, you need to get, you need to get with it. Like we should move the park somewhere that people can see. We need to do it pr properly. We need to basically tell your marketing department to stop marketing because they don't have a clue. And somehow, again, it was my like young brain of like, at that point, I didn't really care. I wanted to do it, but I didn't care. And this was like prior to the super park, whatever. And that hit a nerve with somebody. And all of a sudden I was at back at Lake Louise and I had ties to them from doing work in the past. And they were like, okay, what do you want to do? And I was like, oh, we should redevelop the park. Like it should be under the lift right here. Like that's prime location for a park. It's right under the lift. People want to see it. It'll force you guys to keep it maintained. And it'll be like a showstopper. Look at the background. And all of a sudden they were like, okay. You know, it was like, I don't know if it was that quick, but all of a oh, sudden I was in photos, those images from those years are ingrained. Yeah, in and my that's head. and that's it, right? So I think I came at it at that point. I was already coming at it also with this like, man, if you're gonna build these things, it costs a lot of money. I knew that. And I also knew it was a lot of work because I'd driven cabs. And I, but I also knew that you can't beat the backdrop in Victoria. You can't beat the backdrops at Lake Louise there. No. And the lodge even, like all these things. So it was like being able to sell that to them. And then we started the park and we named it. And we had uh, Michael Corner jumped in. He was like he's an unbelievable artist. He, he ran the program. He had like, and it was full of these guys who just wanted nothing more than to shred every day. But all of a sudden we're given an opportunity to have like more snowmaking than we needed which was awesome. Like the guy that was in charge of snowmaking basically like, oh, we'll just leave those guns. And we just kept mowing it over. <laughs> anyway, and yeah, it ended up, we got to build these like huge jump lines, um, inadvertently pissed off the World Cup people because they had the race there early season. Anyway, um, yeah. So we, we got to put ourselves in a position where we had, and it had nothing to do with my skills of doing anything. I was like, yeah, this is the layout. I think we can do a jump line. And I'm like, I could push snow. Um, but when you look at what we did and then compare it to what like Beck and Sal and, and Lucas Hule and all the like park guys now are doing, it's like they're, they're like building works of art, you know? And that's what separates it is like at the time we were like moshing as much snow as we could to build a giant landing. And you might, we'd take some time to shape the jump and make sure it looked okay. But it was like, that was the first step of like, I think they're going to let us do this. But you weren't spending time to like make everything look pretty. In the end it did, you know, it looked great, but. It was like that ability, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, we're inviting you to Super Park. It's like, oh, look at that. We got we got invited to Super Park, and they're like, we're going to have Super Park at Lake Louise. And it was like, whoa. I got a question for you. Was Super Park, back in the day, they would hire different park builders from different locations, and then like they would get you in, somebody from California, somebody from Colorado, yeah. and then they would build one feature. So it would kind of be so, like a, like you guys are battling to like it showcase was, your so skills. So right? at the I think the first, it kind of shifted. So Mark Sullivan was involved. He was a, it was like his brainchild, Super Park originally, which who was with Snowboarder. Um, and Bridges was there at the time as well. Um, and if I remember correctly, what it was, was, you know, we got invited to Breckenridge and it was, so it was hosted by Breckenridge, but I think the first year it was, uh, I want to say Mammoth Mountain, Breckenridge, Lake Louise, and Nakiska? No, 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 sorry, Nakiska is not in Super Lake Park. Lake Louise either. RCR is what it was. And um, maybe Park City? Or maybe it was just the three. I, I don't know. But that's what it was, was they're like, here's the here's the park run at Breckenridge. Crazy amounts of snow there. You guys have whatever it was, five days, build something. And so what it was, was it was like each crew had two. So I, I went there with Clayton Carroll from Nakiska, and we represented like Lake Louise RCR group. They have cats there waiting. Yep. It was this event sponsored by, you know, I think at the time it was Bombardier, but it might have been print off after. I don't really know. But there was cats there for us. Uh, so each crew had two builders um, and a park or maybe three. I don't know what it, what exactly it was. But yeah, so they were like, here's your zone. Build what you're going to build. And so we just started moshing snow. It was like, we're going to build this. These guys are building this. And it was like everyone built something. And you tried to build it so that, you know, there wasn't it wasn't like you weren't didn't want it to flow. You wanted it to work. Um, but everyone had their own zone to build something. And it was like, I think at that year, Mammoth built this massive green wall ride. That was, I think, Rosenwald and uh, Jeremy Cooper. And I forget, other guys are just, again, legendary guys, right? They're just super into. And oh, it was like Breckenridge yeah. guys, Elliot Cohn and Brad Horder. 
Tim Wesley, I think his name was. They, the Breckenridge guys were awesome. They were just like, it was their home turf, just mowing snow. And like, so you got to hang out with these guys that were just par- other park builders that would be given this opportunity to do something and be recognized for it. Back to that brotherhood thing. You guys kind probably of, all yeah, connected, yeah, exactly. but yeah, like yeah. it's a and healthy competition. Totally. And it really, at that point, I don't even actually think at that point it was a competition amongst the drivers. It was just, it was super progress for the riders. But we were all there representing the resorts. And then a couple of years after that, they did it as like, the winning or the feature builders or whatever they might have given some kind of prize to whatever team did the coolest thing or whatever but yeah so we we did that and like even just being invited to that first one meeting those other guys was awesome and then all of a sudden bridges like hey well i think we're gonna do it like louise and it was like this big holy crap like for us as snowboarders knowing the history of super park it was massive right huge ties to the industry huge ties to the best things in snowboarding unfortunately like somewhat falling on deaf ears with the marketing department because when you look at the guys who do the numbers on you know what they're spending and who they're marketing to super park doesn't quite market to the people who read you know the newspaper or whatever so they didn't see it quite like we did where we came off of the first year of super park at lake louise and had like i don't even know how many pages of print and video and there was stuff from lake louise all over the place and we tried to put a value on that to bring it to market like look what we did like we didn't have to do anything. And they were like, well, that doesn't really sell to the people we want to sell to. And that was kind of the response, right? So we had a couple of years of like very big things with Super Park that were amazing for on a personal level because we had my buddies all coming to build with us. We had great, great weather. We got to see all these unbelievable pros come. Got to build some cool stuff. Like they gave us a budget to build, which was cool for Lake Louise because we operated on like not the most substantial budget, but like, you know, we built this giant A-frame up rail thing which yeah. was like a monstrosity but it was something that we thought up and was like no one's done this like we should do this and now we have money from snowboarder to do it and we built it and it was sick and, and long story that like all that stuff had to be taken down and when it gets taken down and put to the side in and you got a bunch of guys who aren't tied to the park program or a bidder because they didn't get to come in and build because they were like and those rails all got like sideline destroyed in the parking lot like louise because somebody with like a excavator just decided to push them out of the way and you know <laughs> anyway that's the kind of stuff that would happen but um we got that to do that we got to was yeah i love that it was a great one and then we did the uh the other one which was like i remember bridges saying it was like the most expensive jib feature of super park or something but we did the huge quarter pipe and then did the scaffolding with the hanging jib box in it Oh, yeah. Travis Williams had some crazy, yeah, crazy Travis things. Travis did, and Peter Lyon had a couple of sick shots on there. TJ, but it became this yeah. thing where it was like, it was a multi use jib thing that no one had done. And it was kind of silly, but it was like, who else is going to put a, when are we ever going to have the budget to hang a jib box, you know, whatever it was, 15 feet above the coping of the quarter pipe and be able to have a bomb drop thing off the back. And, and you know, so we had these things that were like, it was fun because we got to do something that you'd never get to do. But it was also fun because we were like showcasing the fact that we had this amazing backdrop and we had the snow and we had the guys that were willing to do it. We had an amazing park crew. Let me pause you there for a second and ask you who these are huge jumps at this point, especially (laughs) the super park, like super park air. Super park is like where people are going to go fucking big. Yeah. Who do you remember? killing it at super park and who do you remember being like the guinea pigs because a lot of guinea uh, pigs because i'm good, close friends with kevin griffin and griffin yep. was obsessed with super park yeah he worked at lake louise he forever did. he worked yeah, at he nikiska did. he was like all yeah, about Griff. like canadians have to guinea pig it's like what makes us dope and like you gotta like so he would always be like yeah. kind of rooting for like he'd be like hardingham would guinea pig yeah these you know people. i i, I there's a longer part of that question um, the, yeah, the, I think, I think each crew had their own rider that came with the crew. Like our first year in Breckenridge, it was James Beach came with us. He was our rider. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, so you Guinea before Super Park starts. Well, we had a rider to help us design. Like we, that was part of the whole Super Park thing it was like, you had the park builders and then you had a rider representative, like to, to whether it was to test or to help design or whatever. Beach came with us. He was our, he was our guy for the first one. Um, the second couple that were at Lake Louise, it didn't really matter. We didn't really have a rider representative because we had the crew of Alberta. Um, and I was very lucky. Um, again, going back to that whole like ballsy Alberta rider thing. I, um, I never had a problem finding people to guinea pig stuff that I built, which was a lifesaver because 
generally I was pretty confident with almost everything that I had built. I'm like, oh, this is big, but it's going to work. Like I had, because I had some knowledge of riding, like I knew, but it was never hard to be like, hey, Hardingham, I have a jump ready tomorrow. Do you want to come and guinea it? Sure. Yeah. What time? <laughs> and Craven or Scotty Shaw or you know, Brennan Robson or like Goldsmith. There was like a crew of guys in Banff that aren't like, they weren't super pros. And they would come at any point to be like, I've been watching you build that all week. When am we going to go? And it was like, <laughs> it was, uh, it was so all time. Sick. Right. And, and it also gives that feedback of like those guys, because I knew them and knew what they could do. I wasn't worried about their skill level to jump off anything or to hit anything. It was always like, I knew who I could take feedback from to make it better because I knew them all for a long time. Whereas there was a few other guys that would come in for events, a contest, whatever, that were always the chirp. Oh, this isn't going to work, Bubba. And I loved it when that would happen. Like riders meeting, oh, the front, there's not enough in run. Whatever. And then it would be like, oh, well, you know, those guys all hit it yesterday and said it was great. You know what I mean? And like, because they didn't know, right? It was just like, there's always those people that are complaining. It might not be kicky enough or it's too kicky or whatever. But yeah, I think guinea pig wise, if I remember correctly at Super Park, um, Dom Pelosi was was very he was a part of our park crew i remember that name Dude, well good he's a good snowboarder really good snowboarder and also actually got into cats afterwards he left he was doing gross for a little while i don't know what he's doing anymore but yeah leanne's brother um he guinea pigged a couple of things at super park um that like a couple of the riders had like speed checked in to say oh, i don't think it's gonna work and dom was like oh, it's fine. and he went and did it and so, like, opening a session up, as far as opening a session up goes, he also, like, story about Dom, uh, one of the years uh, at Snow Park, we built, uh, I really luckily had a tie through old snowboarding, through Tech 9 and whatever. Uh, Blotto was a team manager for, team manager at the time, anyway, with Burton. And so, the year prior, we had had Travis Rice and Gooch and stuff, but we'd done this quarter pipe session. And then we got snowmaking and we did all this stuff and it was like, oh man, Chili's having a bad year. Like I kind of heard Burton was looking for a place and I like, so I, I think I called up Blotto and was like, hey, listen, like, we got stuff at Snow Park. You guys should come and shoot. And it was the Unink team at that point, right? That we were going to shoot with. So, so yeah, so we're down at, we're down at Snow Park and funny enough, like my crew at Snow Park, there was some amazing Kiwi riders and crew there, but we also had some Canadians that obviously had to come down. So this guy, Dylan Gilmore was down for a while. Um, and Dwayne Weep came down. Leanne was down doing some stuff. And Dom was there as one of our park crew for Snow Park for a summer. And so we built this jump for the Uninked guys, which uh, we didn't have enough snow to build, but it was huge. It was like 100 foot or whatever. And I remember, like Roman, everyone had looked at the jump and was like, oh, there'll be speed. You had to tuck it from the top of the hill. And Dom was on a mission. He was like, he wanted to hit it first because he wasn't going to be in the session, right? It was the Uninked session jump or whatever and so dom like rode the lift up and i think it got out to roman that dom was going up to guinea the jump or whatever and i think he got a sled rip up and ended up he, i think i think roman got the guinea on it but they un both wanted it yeah well because i think <laughs> i know i think what it was was and again okay this is all memories and what i can remember but what i think happened was roman or maybe it was Giddy, one of the two kind of caught wind that one of our park crew was going to go guinea the jump because we had built it and then rebuilt it, whatever. And I think one of them got a zip, a zip up on the sled to the top of the hill and pointed it and ended up hitting it and actually like clearing it, did it. But Dom at the time was like riding the, I think it was a T-bar. It wasn't even a lift at that point. Dom was going up to hit it. And so like Dom went up and pointed it from the top of the hill and came in just big backs of knees. And like landed like 30 feet down off the neck, like massive, man. I have a sequence of it. It's like 100 and has to be from lip to landing 125 feet or something. Like huge <laughs> backs of an 80. And then came and was like, he was stuck, right? Like, it works. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but yeah, it was like those kind of guys. And there's, and it's rad to have those guys because you're, you know, at that point, all of a sudden, you know, there was also a, a, a break over year of like sitting in a cat for so many years and doing all this work, but also, you know, not snowboarding at that level anymore, right? Like the first few years, it was like everything I was building, I was hitting. I was like still in it, still doing all this stuff. And then it gets to the point where it's like, oh, I'm not hitting that. Like I'm not getting paid to snowboard. I'm not. And I've blown out both my knees and that, like, you know, it was paid the price. And so it was like there comes a time when you have to like fold the cards too, but also be like confident that you're 
doing it. You know, that's why you get guys like Beckinsale now that are building these phenomenal artworks that are so perfect, and he can still draw it and hit that stuff, dude. He's, it's, he's it's insane. Boss for sure. So, yeah. So no, I was stoked. That was a. I actually I ended up uh, meeting him years years before at uh, again getting tied in. There's so many weird rabbit holes, but um, was down at this thing Style Wars in Australia and met him when he was riding and. He got into CAD and somehow tied in that someone I knew called about him and he ended up being in Whistler Building Parks and has gone on to do amazing things. And luckily I was stoked a few years before, I mean it was years ago now, but we spent almost three years. We were over to China for multiple trips to start building parks over in China before they got going and I was I did a couple trips over on my own and then they were like, we need help, like who would you think? And I was able to like bring Charles in luckily because the guy's like, you know, again, I could, I was at the point where I hadn't really done much in a cat for years, but I was given an opportunity and I just got to watch him work. He's like, your, I just, he's your I just, Justin Craven. I just pushed snow <laughs> and was like, hey, you go ahead and finish that. Like, he's you know, just so good at what he does. But yeah, yeah it was cool. fucking amazing. Really cool to Style be Style Wars. Did, so you, that was a big one. Did you shit yep. those jumps too? Uh, one year with uh, Mike Gershner from, he used to be the mammoth Dude, guy. those jumps were huge. Yeah, there were some good ones there. Um, yeah, I don't know what year that would have been. I just I remember, know. like, who, what's the biggest jump you've ever built? Uh, or that you recall? Oh, I don't know, man. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe one of those ones in New Zealand, like the, the big Burton jump in New Zealand was pretty big, that one. Uh, we built a really massive one in Norway one summer, and I, I honestly don't remember what the measurements on it were. There's been a few, like, substantially large ones. Because um, we, I, it was also, like, I kind of was at a weird time in park building where there was, like, it wasn't necessarily shape at the time. It was like distance and, you know, there was like this big push for these massive cheese wedges, which weren't obviously the best things all the time either. Like, oh, there were step downy. Um, step downs. Dude. So, got, you know, and, oh. and a lot of that was also due to like lack of, uh, lack of snow too, right? Like you get to different places where like they want a big jump, but you don't have enough snow to push like a up knuckle 80 foot or whatever it is. Whereas like now when you know you need those and you can commit to it. And also having the machinery, like a lot of the early parks we did, there's no way they were letting us get in a winch cat, you know? That was like for serious operators. So it was like, you know, so you have these jumps where you had like build a big thing and the landing was pretty good, but it was never like what you wanted because you'd need to have a winch and they wouldn't let us. We were park builders. They weren't, weren't getting I don't remember the early jumps at Super Park feeling touchdown. I remember being like, I'm lucky I'm young because it takes everything, <laughs> all of my muscle to ride away yeah, from this thing because yeah. it's like, an 80 foot, 90 foot jump, but then you drop out of the fucking sky yeah. into yeah. the fucking landing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was a rush and I loved it, yeah. but like it was, but like I said, there's like, there's so many good connections through all those things, whether it was like the park stuff was awesome. It let me do things and travel the world for a long time, but that opened up the doors for me for like photography and doing all these other things. And then meeting, like I got to meet all these like guys who were, you know, celebrity I mean, photography it, must so. have been a nice thing. Like you touched earlier on that you have, you know, potentially ADHD and like some attention, some spectrum s- issues, some spectrum <laughs> issues. Like I feel like maybe I've never gotten diagnosed. Maybe there's some ADHD in there. I would, I think so. I'm going to think a lot of myself. us. I think a lot of us do like, and think, yeah. the camera to me is just because you get to zero in, you're just honing in yeah. and it's just, you, you just put everything into like the eyepiece yep. and everything else becomes quiet and you're yep. just focused. I really like that. Yeah. There's, there's something to be said about that. Again, that was, I think we talked about it earlier. I was, I was presented with a lot of things on how I've uh, guided my career choices and made my own career path based on the fact that I was not, um, I didn't have the mind frame to have people telling me what to do, which I've passed on to my son actually, which is why all these things have come to light. But, um, uh, the photography end of things for me, uh, in a, uh, like I didn't know it, but it does allow you to um, kind of mask. You're able to stand off on the sidelines and and capture something and be creative, which is another thing with a lot of people who have like a brain that thinks a little different, right? Whether it's a, a spectrum ADHD autistic spectrum thing is like you have an outlet to capture a moment and you can hyper focus to capture that one moment. And it gives you that positive feedback because you can share that. So you're getting your feedback in different ways. Like now it's digital. You can get it instantly. It's like a great, and that's how you can get sucked in. I get sucked in Instagram because I love images and I always have. And it's the same with magazines. Unfortunately, we don't have access to like the same magazines we used to, right? 
there isn't the weekly run to the store to find out what new trans world or snowboard or whatever comes out. But having that feedback as a photographer became super, uh, a super big drive for me because it was like, oh, I can capture this still moment that someone finds cool enough to put in a magazine that other people are going to want to see. So it's like, it's, it's a slower loop, but it still gives you that. You f the, the, what you feel when you open up a tangible page and see a print or, you know, that kind of stuff is like, it's lasting. It isn't just like a quick uh, like button. It's like, a, that's, that's there. That's in print. That's, it's a very big thing, I think, you know. Um, right. But all of that stuff, having that feedback through being reinforced with the riders because you're stoked on a sport, being reinforced by the sport because they like what you're building in the park, being reinforced by magazines and your peers because you've captured moments that other people want to see. There's always that thing and you want to have that in life, I think, no matter what you do. But if, you're, if you have that hyper-focus where you're focusing on something, um, it's nice to get back that feeling that you're doing it for a reason. Um, and that, I think, again, ties into the whole reason why when I started collecting boards, it wasn't because I was like, I'm going to collect a bunch of these and they're going to be worth a lot of money. It was like, man, that's, look at that old board. It's like crazy graphic on it. Oh, look at that board. That was like, you know, that was like Devin's first model or John Boyer's. First. Oh, that's cool. Oh, the, the guy who drew all the art for that is a buddy in Vancouver. Oh, the, you know, and there's like ties to all this stuff. And you can always do that with him. You can justify whatever you can but it's um my whole thing with that was like i had became infatuated with the history of the sport and i became infatuated with the way things were constructed and i ke became infatuated with and it just becomes a rabbit hole where you're like that was my outlet and when snowboarding got me to the point where i was at like i was shooting photos i was able to do all these things and travel and it all led to these oh, i'm going to collect these things and there was no end to it um and then like I said, luckily i had all these people around that were all given positive reinforcement and then you know the fallout of my photography or the end of it came at a great time kind of because all the magazines were shutting a lot of them anyway like you you've known you've seen it um but yeah we went up uh actually went up to boldface to do uh, we were meeting with a bunch of like-minded individuals the vintage snowboard collectors group which started off as like not very many guys that were just all nerding out about old snowboards we met up at boldface and we had a meetup where we like traded snowboards and went up to Baldface with Jeff invited us up and we did a little gathering and it was awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, in a in a very quick moment, it went from like the coolest thing ever to, you know, like there's a jump in front of the lodge and we're all still you know, doing these fun things. And I was like, did a jump in front of the lodge, got towed in by JP to get whipped over surface with a fisheye, like the greatest things ever. I'm getting a photo taken by surface. I'm riding a sims board from 1986 to get a photo of the you know it was the greatest thing ever and all of a sudden it was like i didn't check the landing very well and there's a rock you know covered by a dusting of snow and all of a sudden i break my back and i'm getting airlifted out of bald face and i'm like oh i'm probably not going to shoot this winter i wonder what i'm going to do and and that collapse of all of that is is like the end of my positive cycle was about that moment where it was all of a sudden like i got kids i wonder how i'm going to pay the rent <laughs> and uh and having the uh, inability to go out sledding for a winter and losing you know a, a contract with sim shooting without shooting with gaitan and i was shooting for burton at the open and i had all these like really cool ties and writing and that ended in a split second where all of a sudden it's like you can't you can't walk for the next while you've done this you know and these aren't gonna and all of a sudden it's an eye opener of like jeez i had all my eggs in one basket kind of like i can't sit in a snow cat i can't take photos uh and and then luckily, again, it's like I luckily was the last couple of years before that trying to, I don't know if I ended, ever ended up with you, but I was really into trying to get new angles. I'd been around Whistler long enough that I'd seen all these places shot. And I was like, how can I get my camera into different places? And I started early on trying to build drones that I could lift my camera with, with remote triggers to get to go shoot things like the forum step down and all these from an angle that no one had shot photos from before. And it was all super primitive, and I ended up getting out a couple of times but when I was recovering from being injured. Dove into that, and it was like a hyper focus of diving into that, which all of a sudden someone's like, "Film world wants to fly cameras. You shouldn't be taking photos." And now that spurred my next like, I'm still tied to the snowboard industry with trying to collect and start this museum project. But I'm like, I get to fly drones 
for a film. And like, I keep looking at snowboarding all the time when it's blue and I see people now with these drones that are super easy and they're all doing, and I'm like, I'm jealous of it, right? In You're ways, so far ahead of the I'm curve. I'm jealous, I'm super oh. jealous of it because I'm like, I'm thinking of the amount of crap I tried to carry into the backcountry to shoot uh, early on. And now it's like, you know, you can pull it out of your backpack and put it in the air for 20 minutes. And like, <laughs> but anyways, like it's a lot, it's opened up a whole new world of like, and again, it's a, it's a, it's something you can hyper focus on is like, I still get to go snowboarding all the time with my kids. I have this tie to the industry with um, still having a fascination with the history and having this collection of things that I've like, it's been years now. Of like the only reason I still collect it is because there's stories tied to each little piece and then that needs to be shared because there's going to always be generations of new kids coming into it. And if you went out to most of them that have started snowboarding in the last 10 years and told them that there was a company called Flight or told them that there, you know, like they would, there's no, no tied to anything like that. And the, uh, and it is a, you know, it's to us, it's not a, it's not like it's an old sport by any means, but there is so much colorful history that's come from the sport, um, since just before, like, you know, from the seventies on. So there is all these things that are like, allow me to stay involved. And it fulfills that little part of my brain. That's like, gotta still. what's the best era of snowboarding? Uh, the best era. Yeah. Like a, in a five-year window, <laughs> like what do you think was the raddest uh, era that represented like? I think, yeah, that's a hard one. I don't know. Like, I don't know if you can. It's like trying to pinpoint one rider that's done something. Like, I don't think you can. I think there's like, as far as like, the growth of the industry and the amount of just crazy stories and, and, stuff happening at rapid pace. I would say like. 90, 95 to 2000. So just well, like that was crazy. Chaos. Like, and no Money. one, yeah. When you talk to people about the stories and stuff that were happening at trade shows and, and riders and the budgets they had and the trips they went on and the things that happened that they just walked away from, like just, you can't ever go back to that, you know? And like, I didn't get to experience a lot of that. I experienced the sideline of a lot of that. And I got to experience the stories from a lot of that. Like, you know, there's just, um, but yeah, I don't know, man. There's, it, you think of things now, like I look at what my kids are growing up watching. Like, I can't fathom being, my kids are 10 and 13 and they can't, they can't figure out that like the first time I saw a snowboard was, you know, I'm 10 years old or whatever it was. There was no sport of snowboarding really at that point. And they haven't figured, you know, I'm like trying, barely to, trying to tell them that, right? Like, it's like, you guys, you know, my, my kid was in snowboard lessons and started to shred on gear that was made for a kid at five years old. It was like, that didn't exist, you know, when you're, <laughs> and it's not that long ago, that didn't exist. We were like, you know, I was your size and I picked up a pair of crappy Sorrells and a camper board that weighed 35 pounds. And that was my intro to snowboarding after sliding down the hill on a wooden thing with fins like it's just so it's come so far so when you look at like you look at like stuff that my kids look at now and think that that's just normal snowboarding it's baffling you it know? is it is so baffling i love showing them like oh here's a show we just went and visited uh jonathan moore pulled into port the other night in squamish with his boat he's been rebuilding for 10 years what? and it was the craziest thing i need jonathan like, moore on this fucking you do dude, he's got yeah dude, what, a, what a human um but like it was this eye opener of like holy crap like 10 years ago he started rebuilding this sailboat it was like just before my youngest was born you know and he's got it in the water like two months ago he sailed it over to squamish and we're chatting and i'm like it's awesome that i can tie this guy and my kids are just like yeah we've known jonathan like they've heard stories but i can pull up a photo of him from our trip to Alaska and deeper, you know, or wherever, like dropping Sterling's pillows or dropping a spine line that he hiked in, you know, like, and be like, that's the guy that, you know, and they're like, oh, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Like, there's just like, there's these characters and it's just uh, that it's different, right? Like I grew up with that, like seeing those guys riding those big lines and the changing of freestyle, but also like the, the progressive backcountry stuff that those guys did. I was just like, whoa, you guys are, you guys are, taking like some heavy park stuff into the backcountry, and that wasn't that was new now it's just like you know sideline like all of you, you know, like all the crew that you rode with and all that like these guys are just like taking it to another level but it's like when you can rewind it back to johnson and kearns and those dudes like getting sleds and going exploring 
you know, and finding all those jumps that people still hit to this day. But at the time, we were like, do you think you can make that? Well, yeah, I think so. Let's build a cheese <laughs> wedge here. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> now it's like, oh, you know, it works. You can you can look at 20 years of history and know it works. What can be done? What can't be done? Like, <laughs> it's a funny it's a funny thing, but it isn't, you know, it isn't that old, but it's old enough. that There's so many colorful stories that I think are like important to capture before, you know, you look at guys like Jake that aren't here anymore and the stories he shared, but the ones that he didn't get to. And like, you know, it's been years now, but I got to go down and hang out with uh, Ernie DeLost and Chuck Barfoot and like spent a day and the stories just from the conversation. I was like, geez, man, like I need five days here because there's just so many things. And those guys are like the OGs, right? So there's not a lot of those guys left to, that, that have the time and the patience and want to be, you know, there's a lot of them that aren't even involved in the industry anymore, but to go back and be able to like document some of those things and pull in the stories because those things are like, that's what sets your timelines. Yeah. You, you always like want more time with, uh, with those special individuals. And then when they do pass, you always kick yourself in the ass being like, I had, that's I had good opportunities to dude, chat with this person. Dude. I never made it happen. Yeah. And now they're gone forever. Like one oh, of my, one of my biggest sucks. regrets I had, uh, I went down to New Zealand, like, I don't know what year it would have been. Uh, maybe this would have been 90. Man, I'll try to figure it out sometime in the 90s. Um, I had just blown out my knee. That's why I know it was the 90s. 99 maybe, 2000. Um, and uh, and I got a, I got a random uh, email or phone call from New Zealand, and it was this, this place that was uh, called Mount Potts Cat Skiing. And these guys were like, hey, we need a we need a cat driver. Like, you, need, you want to come to New Zealand for the summer and drive cat? And I was like, I was recovering from a blown knee. Like, oh, okay. Uh, when do you want me? Like, get on a plane kind of? Like, okay, yeah, sure. And they're like, do you, like, you have backcountry knowledge? Like, yeah, I've, you know, got my Avi one. I've got lots of time on sleds. Like, at that point, I had been spent quite a bit of time. They're like, okay, great. Yeah, we got this cat skiing operation. We need someone that can build the road and, and drive the shuttle. And I was like, oh, it sounds like a cool way to spend the summer. And then I'm getting on the plane and confirming everything's going on, the guy goes, I'm going to pick you up, and there's a bunch of people here you're probably going to be stoked to see because you're into snowboarding. I'm like, okay. And, you know, I get picked up in Christchurch and shuttled down this Erewhon Valley into the middle of nowhere and, and open the lodge door, and it's like Craig, Gucci, Sioni, uh, Michi. <laughs> like, these dudes are, I'm like, oh, boy. Like, the, the who's who of, like, and, you know, I'm still just, like, kid, like, oh, my God, these dudes are here? What? Like, I get to... I get to shuttle around my heroes. Craig Kelly? Yeah. So you get to meet Craig yeah. again. Well, and it was like, no yeah, but it was like, and again, it was such a weird thing because at that point, having known he's gone on, he's like free riding. He's, he's like the godfather already. Like, you know, he's left competitive snowboarding. He's just designing. It must have been summer 2000 or something, 2001. Anyway, um, so cool, right? Like get to be in the middle of nowhere with these guys and they're filming and he's, he's, designing or working with the first generation of Burton's like split gear and like kind of like super timid right like don't like he's sitting in the corner reading a book like super such a mellow guy but like I don't want to bug him <laughs> you know <laughs> like so we talked a little bit and like got to got to like hang out with those guys for a couple of weeks as they were like in New Zealand filming and, and doing these things at the Katsuki place but also down the valley and ended up like getting connected with him a little bit got his email like talking about you know trying to ride at that point i was already taking photos a little bit but obviously not like i wasn't really doing it to make a living I weren't ready gonna... to shoot Craig no Kelly. exactly right so um did you get my method yeah. you're like uh ah, yeah, just... might have been a little bit um, out of focus and like yeah like i said so big regrets is like here's this chance and uh it was like that maybe the next winter i don't even know what it was but I finally am like, hey, I'm, uh, um, would be stoked to to line up and shoot some photos. What's your what's your winter looking like? And like, and the, again, the nerd in me, like, I have this I have this email account I haven't used for years, and I keep it alive. And the only reason I keep it alive is because I have like replied emails from Craig and and John Buffery, and like, because I was like, I was like, oh, I'm gonna be hanging out in Nelson. We're working on this bald face place, and blah, blah, blah. and I was like, then I applied to I think 
maybe direct me to buff to see if I could get in to drive snowcat. <laughs> like I have these weird conversations, yeah. you know, but it was like um, it, the regret of, of ever of like, I didn't have the confidence in my own abilities to be, to follow through with basically an invitation from Craig to come and hang out in Nelson and take some, like, I just didn't have it in me. And I was like, I can't, if I can't screw up a photo of this guy, you know? But so it's, it's a very weird thing yeah. to be like in the position now where I'm like, man, I blew it because that was the chance. And obviously, you know, we all know what happened. It's like, he lost that, that ability to go. And that would have been game changing, but who knows where it would have left. But it's, it's like, take those opportunities. Right. And I've, I think I've been pretty lucky with, either like taking the opportunities I had or creating those opportunities. And there's definitely a few of them where I'm like, Oh shit. Shooting Craig <laughs> Kelly. Shooting Craig <laughs> yeah, Kelly was exactly. definitely a miss. <laughs> and like, you know, we got some great tie ins and did a couple of very cool things that were um, all because of ties through that whole thing. But yeah, it was like, you know, we can look back and see all these little choices. We're like, damn it. <laughs> yeah. But then Should you gotta, there. <laughs> yeah. But then you're, you zagged and you just got to look back and be like, I'm one of the lucky ones who got to meet Craig and experience just like Craig. Kelly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. See it. And in also his... being able to like, you know, again, it's positive reinforcement of the fact that it's like, there's somebody that you, there's people you can put on pedestals because of the things that they, uh, they either accomplished or the things that you wanted to accomplish that they were showing you the way to do. Um, and there's obviously people that have been able to go on and do like amazing things within the industry that you can hold up there still and be like, man, that person did some awesome stuff and still is and there's people that didn't get a chance to because of situations um but you can always think like you could tell that they would there they would have continued you know so there's i think there's still there's still tons of people doing that stuff so. okay so you miss out on shooting craig but like <laughs> let's talk on who are some of the your your favorite individuals that you've ever gotten to shoot over your career because you've worked with like all of the best <laughs> throughout the last 30 uh, years so like do you have a couple highlights? Like, I really enjoyed working with this individual or? Um, well, like f off the top of my head, like I can think of, I don't think I think of the, oh, I can. I can think of people that I've worked with that I, that I just loved working with because they were fun. Um, I think I, I think I take away, like I even do it now with like, if I look back at my photos that I took. There's certain things where I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. But it's all about, it's more about the memories of like where it was or what happened with that. Like there's always a, an image or there's always like a story that went with it that was super fun. As far as like people um, and opportunities, I think like one of the uh, coolest opportunities wise, um, Jonathan, uh, being able to get the chance to go like on the deeper trip, that was like a, I got called by a satellite phone from Jonathan, like, hey, our photographer that's been here, we get snowed out for the last two weeks. Like, do you want to come do this? It's me and Travis and Jeremy. And I think Johan's leaving. Rylan Bell's here. And it was like, I gotta, it was that comfort level thing, just getting whipped from under you. And I was like, I'm getting called from Jonathan, who's like somebody I've known forever, but I know what he does. And I know what Jeremy does. And I know what Travis does. <laughs> You want me to go to Alaska? Okay, yeah, that seems like a cool adventure. Yes, I'll do, you know, and let's make it happen. Oh, and Newsom, we need a guide. Like, Newsom, call Newsom, we need a guide. So that trip in general was rad because it was so out of my comfort zone. I had never winter camped. I had never been to Alaska. I had never split boarded. I was like, holy crap. I'm getting float planed in to the middle of nowhere to shoot with Jeremy and to shoot with Trap and to shoot and as a sideline coolest trip ever because Newsom, who i've known forever is gonna be our guide and jonathan who i've been shredding with and grown up with since he was super young and then gary pennegrass is there filming so it's like we have this crew of like old guys that have all been like canadian like just buddies and we're gonna get to hang out and do this super cool thing and like obviously there's there's Travis and Jeremy too, you know? So that whole thing was just like such a cool experience to be out in the middle of nowhere and like, okay, you know, getting dropped off in a float plane and unloaded a bunch of gear. And then like given about five minutes to experience the fact that I was like way out of my element and there's crevasses everywhere and whatever. And then having Travis be like, I right, throw your harness on. We're going to go hit this thing at sunset. And it was like, Oh, right into it. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm on a rope 
trying to learn how to split board while I hike up to this ridge line above our camp in Alaska with Travis to do a sunset shoot on. I was just the whole time, just like this is a bag of stress, man. So out of my element, but Did yeah. Did you walk out of the photo, uh, that trip with some good photos of those guys on that deeper trip? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think we ended up with like, whew, I don't know what it turned into. Two features. It actually was a bit of a weird one. That one, um, the first group of guys, the first group was there, and they ended up getting snowed out. But they had a photographer from Europe with them. And that was like a, his story was like a 10 page story in trans world, 10 or 12 pages in trans world. And then I ended up coming out of it and doing another like 10 or 12 pages from my two weeks with that same crew minus Johan um, in Snowboard Canada. So yeah, unbelievable. Like, and, and like watching what they did, right. They're like boot packing up stuff. That's like savage, like savage, savage stuff. Again, like I hiked into places with Gary where like, luckily Gary was there. Like, guys was a beast way way out of my element hiking up into stuff like using a using a the end of a snow shovel as an axe to get up to stuff because you're just like hanging with like a heavy camera bag because i packed way too much crap because i thought i needed it <laughs> you know just like that kind of stuff like amazing memories so that that is like one of them but that there's was there's awesome. many more man like i got i got to go to i got to go back to alaska finally like a few years later uh, Newsom had some stuff with Eddie Bauer, and I got to go back to Alaska with Newsom and Chris Coulter, and I got to watch Newsom shred meteorite with waist deep blower pow, and I got to watch him. Right, you know, it was like I got to watch a guy that I was like, I I knew from when I was younger that was the guy, and he's still doing his thing, and get to watch him shred stuff that I was just like, this is insane, and Coulter too, right? Like those guys are great. So, and and like bonus of that trip, man, we had some extra heli time, and Gooch was waiting for the Volcom crew. So the last day, we just went free riding and burnt the rest of our heli time, and I got to go shredding with Coulter and Newsom and Gooch. So it was like the kid in me, right? I was like, this is the best thing ever, you know? Um, so they like it's all period stuff where it's like, you know, if I can look back at all of that, there's like plenty of times like riding pow with the Keenan brothers or shooting with Dustin or shooting with Scott Shaw or like there's TJ, like endless amounts of stuff where you just like, I'm thankful for every one of those trips and all those things. Um, and then opportunity wise, being given this opportunity to do things like get to guest photographer at bald face you know like i i got to jump in and go to a place that i could never just go to just to go shredding because i've been this dirt bag photographer you know like never really on the radar for like i'm gonna just book my time in the bald face this week but i've been able to go there like quite a few times i've got to shred that place is magic i've got to shred like some of the best deepest power runs of my life partnering with jamie lynn you know like, I could never go back and tell the kid of me that I was like, I was partners with Jamie. <laughs> I heard him yelling just like me down that run and high fived, you know? And it's like, he's just like us. We're like this guy that's like instrumental in snowboarding, but we just went and shredded powder. And at the bottom, you're high five. And like, I got it last winter. We got scared. Uh, cheeky monkey, man. Like, waist deep cheeky monkey. I got to go and do follow cam with Salama. And like, I've, I've been lucky enough to be up a couple of times with him on trips man the most positive dude ever such a good human and just like knowing the guides you know like what are we doing next oh we, you should we do a follow cam it's pretty stormy today yeah let's do a follow cam maybe next round or the next round and then it's like guides like we're going to cheeky monkey so i'm like, i think we should do a follow cam this run <laughs> oh where are we going cheeky monkey oh we're gonna follow cam this run you know like and you're like with people that are so stoked to snowboard and just like blasting the best run ever you've been there so having those opportunities that I've been able to, you know, like hopefully I can at some point share those with, I want to bring my kids there, right? Like if I can bring my kids to three days of bald face one day so they can experience that like community because that's the modern, t like there's, there's no, there's no way to go back in time to experience that, like going to a new snow ski resort and meeting the five snowboarders that were there. You can't have that again. But you can get that kind of same feeling going to a place like that where it's like the people that are there are there because they want to just they love to go snowboarding i hate when the bald fist face trips and i get like it is panic. It's, the, it's the worst it's like that when the helicopter's coming to pick you up and you're leaving you're like 
I feel like a kid who just had the best birthday party ever and everyone's leaving and you don't want anyone to leave. Dude, the we moments had, just fly it is. by. It's cra- and it's a crazy low, right? Like you're oh, getting on a helicopter, a but you're like, dude, this sucks. <laughs> like, yeah, totally. You know, as you opposed love- to like, I got on a helicopter once when I was laying on a backboard. That sucked. Yeah. Um, the uh, Yeah, but that's it, right? It's like those, there's moments and you can pull moments out of anything. And there's like, I can go back to West Beach, the, the last like West Beach slash Snowboard Canada jam tour. And I think of that moment because I was like, I was supposed to be there to help shape the pipe and do the big air. And there's like, I got to build things that were crazy and I got to see this, but I also was shooting photos. And I remember running down the deck of the pipe to dive and get an angle of Michael Chuck doing his double chuck out of the thing. And it's like, and I, and like just these moments where it's just like, you, you're not going back to those, but they, they pull back emotions and they pull back thoughts. And it's like being able to be in those times and capture this moment that like, I can share with you and you might know about it. My kids are looking at it like, that looks crazy. But there's like, there's people that have ties to those things emotionally. And then there's people that are just going to look back at it. But there's so many things like that, whether it's a story or video or a a graphic on a board that like those things can all be captured in the stories that go along with them. Because there's a million people that are, you know, a million people, but there's a bunch of people that are holding on to those stories that like deserve to be shared because if not, you know, like, just someone else like oh i remember one time the worst thing is being (laughs) in a moment that you should be appreciating but you feel anxious for whatever reason so you don't take in the moment but you should be present for that moment maybe because it's like insecurity or somebody's around who said something there's been so many times where i'm like at an amazing event or something like that maybe the younger version of me and i'm wasting my time being stressed out about like I didn't do good in the contest today and I knuckled and everyone's thinking about me or like I have a zit on my forehead and everybody can notice or like I was supposed to get this jacket in a medium and it's in a large and everyone thinks I look stupid. It's like what a waste of fucking time. You're with in a group with like amazing like this. There's only so many amazing experiences and by like focusing on like the negative of whatever potentially could have came out of that trip is always just such a waste of time. I always get so mad whenever I'm on any amazing trip with anyone and I find myself like in that thinking, space. yeah, in a stupid space. It's just a waste of time to be thinking yeah. about like, I'm like, I should be present. This guy's talking like I'm talking to Jamie Lynn right now. Yeah. And you're worried about your foot being sore or like, dude, shut yeah. the fuck up and be in the moment. Yeah. I think it's hard though for, you know, for a number of reasons, whether it's like a mental block or whether it's a, an uncomfort or like there's reasons that people go into those spaces. True. Um, and I know, I know from my own now, like I, a lot of times I can look back on, I think I talked to you about it earlier is like, there are things that I can look back on now with more clarity and be like, shit, I blew that. Like Likewise. whether it was a choice in business or whether it was a choice with words I said to somebody or whatever, um, being able to now look back on those and process it and know why, like know why I was in that mind frame and know why I reacted the way I did. Um, but you can't go back and change it. You could go, you go call those people and, you know, if they're there still like, Hey man, I'm sorry about that thing I did 20 years ago, whatever. And, you know, but again, luckily we are, we are in this community where, um, it's such a small community of people. And like, generally speaking, a lot of the people that you interacted with through the years are still somehow tied and they're still, and they know they've been through those things themselves. They've been through those, but I, I hear you on the, the room with like my, I had like crazy social anxieties, man. Like, I could never walk into a I, years. I could never walk into an event or a bar or anything. Just walk in. I could never walk in. I would have to walk in with like a drink in each hand because it gives me something to do. It would, I would Same. always, I'd walk in and like laser. I had to be like, the first thing I do is trying to find somebody I knew in there because it was so uncomfortable walking into those situations without having, having, having a spot. Like, I'm gonna, uh, Oh, there's somebody. Totally. Um, and and then never knowing why just it was just oh that's just the way it is but and then you hear later on like oh no some people are you can just walk in and not even it's a bunch of people yeah you're just gonna do these things but like i said there's like a lot of stuff that's all tied to it's tied to your brain like working into these things whereas like i said like i remember being like so stressed out that i made myself sick for the day leading up to the pro photo showdown when i got invited that year i was like i didn't know if i could go i was like sick sick and it, and it was because i was like i gotta stand up in front of those people and talk you know like yeah um for no reason it's a room full of people that were there because they wanted to go see photos and like 
generally like a ton of them are people that I knew from snowboarding. A lot of them are people that I've shot snowboarding. You know, like there was so much support in those rooms. But to stand up in front of those people for that 30 seconds they give you and actually have to say words that are like, you're like just overwhelming emotions, overwhelming anxieties. And it comes out in different ways. You're like blabbering away. Like, oh. You know what I mean? Like totally. And it and it's uh yeah, but it's all mind thing. It's like you're uh you find your comfort in your in your peers and whether or not like you you are you're hiding or doing whatever you're doing because you're you're steering yourself into those and whether you can deal with that and move on and become a social speaker or whatever. Obviously, if you decide to take that path, you have to deal with it. But there's ways around it. Like here, like I said to you, man, I'm like. That's great. I can sit in here and talk to you, and man, you could you could blow so many hours at the table. I also want <laughs> to like, make this. You're like, okay, like, we got to end this because I've run out of <laughs> digital storage for your rambling. No, I want the I want this place to feel um, comforting for like boarders. You know, if they come in here, they're just like they can relax. Yeah, and like, but it's tough because you know everybody has a different brain. So yeah, and depending on what's going on in people's lives kind of dictates where they're at mentally coming into the day into the conversation yeah. so like for yourself you're saying you're moving so you got like the stress of that and like there's you got you got stuff in your life that's happening right now yeah so i mean i'm really grateful that you set aside the time to drive up here before you have to move and do another trailer load of all your fucking snowboards <laughs> those let, are those, let, for the most part those are done jody i got those out of the way so that the uh, they didn't become a burden at the last minute for no, my wife to complain about they're them. not a burden <laughs> we're stoked that you brought those three boards but um we touched on it um a couple times earlier but i want you to kind of um dive into the snowboard museum where sure. this idea came from and like maybe follow that into a, a second part of the question of like why is it important to preserve our history in the right. first place? Right. So yeah, you asked about uh, where where the idea of the museum came from, um, and I think, I mean, I can't I can't tell you the timeline for when it came about in my head. Um, I think it was something I thought about while I was working shooting photos and whether it was like writing stories, doing interviews, traveling, I was being presented with all of this sideline information. And I had access to, you know, talking to Chuck Barfoot, talking to Jake, talking to these people. Um, and having come from a time where I saw the, the sport booming, but also knowing of the time prior, like hearing about the stories and seeing the photos of guys like Kidwell, and, and all of the other Keith Kimmel and what, what Ken did and what all those guys did and being like, wow, this is like, look at what's happened in the sport. And it just keeps going better. Um, and I think I recognized quite a long time ago that at some point we're going to hit a, hit, a an age say for the sport where people are going to be like, man, we have some history. And if you look back at skiing, it's got years and years and years of history. And a lot of it's been documented and a lot of it's in stories and whatever. But it's old enough that they did that. And with snowboarding, I saw this thing where I was like, uh, whether it was, you know, a story, a photo, whatever, it was getting thrown. It was, it was kind of tossed aside. There's a, a big generation of riders even that were like, it was come and go. You were like, you hit the age of your, you were not firing for a couple of years and see it, you know. Um, and so to me, I was like, man, I think there's this, there's this big chunk of our past that if, if we don't start like trying to figure it out, like curate it, whether it's like just sticking it in a locker or keeping something. And, and again, it didn't start off as me like having this burden of so many things. It was like not that much at the first thing, right? It was like maybe I was in Banff and I had 10 boards up and then it became 20 and then it became 50 and whatever. And it was like, I moved with them and it wasn't that big a deal. I had a storage unit and I just kept adding to it and picking things up and people give me boards and buying boards or trading photos for boards. Like, um, but what it was, was it was, again, it's the stories that tied to each of them. I have a bunch of boards that were given to me that have a story to them. And I have a bunch of photos in magazines that I remember going to the store to buy and tearing apart and then being like, damn, I wish I had that. Oh, I can get it there. Okay, cool. 
So I'm like, wait, there's no magazines anymore. And I all of a sudden I had this thing where it's like people I have all these magazines. Oh, I should try to have an archive of them because where else are you going to be able to go like, and maybe no one will care. Maybe 20 years from now, no one's going to give a shit, really. But to me, I'm like, if I have the time and I, the ability to have people that were going to junk this stuff or want to trade me for a photo I took or whatever, for a board or a t-shirt or a jacket or whatever, like, I should keep care of this stuff. Like, if I'm the one that's doing it, I'm the one that's doing it. But it became this thing where I was like, okay, I think this is like, if you look at just Whistler and the ties that just Whistler Blackcomb has in the sports history, it's like ground zero. You know, like there's there's definitely a big chunk that comes from Calgary, but there is like a boom in Whistler and it's where everybody wanted to go. And it's there's a reason. And that has to be there has to be some value put on that. Um, and so I think in my head, I was just like, well, I've got ties to the industry. I've taken photos. I've written for these magazines. I have ties to the, a bunch of the old snowboarders. I'm not coming in just completely cold, wanting to talk and do video work or whatever. Um, so it became something that was easy for me to do, and I had the ability to do it. And then I, I kind of started opening the doors. Um, I guess like we moved here. Like I ended up leaving Banff and moving to Squamish. Like it would be like 19 years, 18 or 19 years ago. And I'd already talked to some guys in Whistler, and you know Whistler went through that thing where they were going to develop their like summer. Remember that big drawings? They were going to do all that stuff. So there was this like little push where it was like it seemed like there was going to be a massive amount of space created for you know community project stuff like a trampoline park skate park whatever there was a lot wave pool like there was i don't even remember but remember how massive that stuff was yeah i remember so there well. was like some stuff that spurred up um and i really actually thought that there back then and this was now years ago now but i was like okay this is like i think this is going to be accepted part like this is a big draw like people come to whistler to snowboard and to ski and to see and to eat and to do all these things but it's like uh it's a destination they, they're coming for a reason and there has to be more to it that's why we have places to go entertain yourself at night why we have nightclubs why we have all these things and um there wasn't a space at that point that was coming available and i just kind of like oh, okay well and then you know veil took over and I kind of let it go for a little while. And then I was like, yeah, I should really spur this up. And I tried to get a hold of some people and really unresponsive in general for, uh, say, the resort end of things. I never actually got an email back from anyone that I contacted at Vail specifically, trying to see if there's any tie to the community to do this like community project. And again, it's really difficult because I also have been here long enough to know like how expensive things are in Whistler real estate's at a premium so no one's going to be like here's 2,000 square feet that you can you know lease for your non-profit oh yeah I have a non-profit I've had so it's legit we have the Canadian Snowboarding Museum and Hall of Fame Society um anyway um but it's really difficult to try to find a space that you can do that it's not a money maker um and there will be a way to monetize it to the point where you should be able to like I think keep it open have somebody there staffing it do wine and cheeses do whatever um, they have them in other places, and I think it's important to to do it somewhere where there's enough people that foot traffic wise and and have the interest in the history, um, whether it's just snowboarding or s s ski hills in general. So I actually um, two years ago I started talking to um, Brad, who's like the curator at the Whistler Heritage Museum, um, and he started helping me arrange some stuff for Canadian museum grants, like a digital online museum grants, um, which is still kind of an ongoing thing. Uh, because there's some there's some grants you can apply for to try to digitally curate um, an archive and it has to be a storyline or whatever so we did put something together and try to um, present it to get a grant for that and unfortunately found out in the end that the cost of uh, doing French language translation which oh. is a which is a everyone's like oh just put it in the AI well you know if you want to get a grant from the Canadian government to do anything it has to be done properly and unfortunately the the French language translation costs uh, for using someone that's approved to be an official vendor or whatever are significantly higher than what the average translation costs. And I wanted something that was pretty uh, video intensive, interview wise and history wise. And um, it all had to be translated into French, not only 
verbally, but it has to be subtitled and available in French as well because it's going to be presented on the Online Museums of Canada. So you have to have it to be accessible for anyone in English or French. Uh, so, long story short, is the first the first uh, interaction with trying to get that didn't work, and and now there's some more that's going to happen. I'm going to keep working on. Um, and then through that whole thing, also have now uh, started the ball rolling and had some communication with Gibbons Group actually, and um, gone to look at a couple spaces that they own and talking about doing something with. And yeah, we'll see how that leads. It's it's a good good tie to the community, I think. And um, yeah, there's something going to come out of it. And I think the more uh, the more eyes and the more people that know about it and start to actually think about whether it's people that have been in town forever or people that have just come or businessmen or whoever, that there is certain things in this town that need to be developed. And we've, you know, we've lost places. We've lost the theater. We've, you know, there's, there's certain things that just don't work. But I think uh, having, having something that can give back to the community but also can show the history of the mountain, the town, and what a sport did for promoting, I mean, not that it needed it, but we still get, you know, Whistler Black on Parks, man. Look at what they've done. It's like the place in Canada. There's no one really, there's other places building parks, but Whistler has always been the place. That's where you go and see, you know, you go see Mark. You go see, you can go see guys any day of the week that are like the most ridiculously good snowboarders that just cycle that park all day long. Um, and I think having having the ability to have a space that people can go in and whether watch an old video or look through old boards or read some magazines or do some study work, whatever you want to do, but having a place that can draw the community in and have a place for kids to go and whether it's they are interested or they become interested. We've lost that. When I grew up, we had the snowboard shops. We would like, we were dirtbags. You know, like you go into the snowboard shop, there was a couch. You like go and sit and watch a snowboard movie in the snowboard shop because it was the shop, you know? And there isn't really that uh, kind of uh, community time. We have the shops, but it's not like you're, you go there to meet your buddies and hang out. Yeah, yeah. Totally. So I think that's important, and I think that it's. Uh, I'll just keep pursuing it. And like you said, we are moving. We've we've had some things uh, in life go down, and we're uh, we're relocating. But it's uh, the ties to this area are still pretty tight. And again, it's um, this is something that I've been like dealing with curating and uh, curating. It sounds like I'm a museum, but like collecting and archiving and talking to people for so many years that it's like, it's not something I'm giving up on. It's just like changing perspective of uh, leaving the Valley and moving away is going to give me more time to focus on some of the things that I haven't been able to. Um, and one of those is, you know, working on whether it's a business plan or the museum grants or striking up some satellite displays, wherever it may be with, um, showing people some of the stuff I have because in reality the only reason that I collected it was to show it to people and it sucks that you know you have these things and these stories that are like they're in boxes or you know you put a few up on the walls but they need to be shared with people and and I think there's a big group of people that would you know appreciate that oh totally and I think, I think there's <laughs> a bigger group of people that don't know that they would appreciate it but would like to appreciate it but they don't even know that they would appreciate it it could be yeah you know what I, I mean, mean? I mean, we it's need, just... we need people to know that you need people to know the history about everything so that they can move forward with some sort of like awareness. And I think yeah. right now there's definitely, um, I'm imagining the newest generation of kids with just social media. Um, thank the Lord that there's still accounts that share a lot of the old stuff so that there's some sort of knowledge about the history but like yeah. there's something about like if you had a snowboard shop and you had like vhs's and kids could put take them out and put the vhs in and kind of get a, an idea of what it's like to like re rewind the video yeah. and and like get that feeling like maybe i don't really know the whole mm, it's tough but w w do you think snowboarding as of late has straight away away from its roots or do you think it's going full circle right now or where do you think we kind of are with snowboarding right now from an outsider because I, feel like, outsider, yeah, yeah, cause I a... feel like you're busy doing other things but i feel like you're so you're such a student of the game and you love snowboarding so much that there's no way that you're not absorbing what you see on your phone and stuff yeah. like that and watching the videos still so it's like you know, you're still attentive, so your yeah, opinion I still matters. Yeah. So, like, I what certainly, do you think? I certainly try to. Uh, I certainly would say that I, I, 
still follow what I can. I definitely don't have the bandwidth to to be fully immersed in in like the newest, the best, the greatest. Um, and because that's changed, you know, I used to get I used to get magazines delivered to my door like a few times. You know, you'd always have them come in and be like, oh, cool, you can see what's going on. Um, and like you said, now it's kind of the the Instagram feed or the people that I know within the industry that are still tied. Um, a lot of that comes from other people, and and I'm very lucky that I still have like a lot of buddies that are still in the game of the media end of things, so I can see that. Um, I do really like that uh, there's been, it seems anyways, there's been a little bit of a, uh, not a push or an acceptance, but I feel like there, we're at a point where there's brands that have been in the game long enough that are accepting that they need to continue to support the people that help them along the way. And it might be like generation two, right? Like, you know, there's the original guys that they were there, and then there's like, these guys were right after them, and we should probably hold on to them. And Jamie Lynn. Ja- well, dude, yeah. Like, Jamie Lynn. Gooch. Jamie Brian Gucci. Like, yeah. um, and I feel like that maybe, uh, hopefully, the, the rest of the industry, the, the problem, or it's not a problem, but the thing I do see is that there isn't a lot of, uh, you know, the original brands or the people that were involved in the original brands that are probably not. Like, I think of people that have sold brands. I don't know who's tied to a lot of those original brands. So you get guys like, with Lib Tech, they've been there. They're tied to the history. They're tied to the people, and they they obviously want to support those guys. And Volcom, they've had guys change. They've had, you know, whatever. But they somehow have been able to retain this. Like we should try to keep supporting Jamie. Like look at that. And Gooch with Arbor, and you know, even Arbor in general, like pulling on people that are like, you know, you're you're giving the ability for them to continue to do something they love and they're giving back to the sport in different ways. Um, and just because they're not the, the new great kid in the park or whatever, there's a, there's a value to that. And I think, I think maybe snowboarding's gotten there a little bit. I think there's still room to grow. Like I love seeing, I love, you know what the coolest thing is seeing Renzi go from like a 10 year old kid that, we used to hang out with and his mom would be at the side of the pipe and you know Jude's is there supporting Mikey and he was you know and watching what he's done and it was cool the other day we're like we went out on this little adventure and we're like he's I think I should ask him just to confirm but he's like the longest running Burton pro team rider no he is yeah and when you think about that anyone who knows him there's a reason you know and he said, you know, like, you know, he wasn't ever the like top paid super pro guy, but he just floated through. Like he's always been that guy, man. He's super happy, continually progressing. And he's putting himself in this thing where it's like, man, every year he's putting out videos that everyone's like, geez, like, still shredding. And well, who wouldn't want to spend a day in the back country with Mikey, right? Like, <laughs> and, and, uh, having, having guys like him on board now that are like, they're still shredding, but they have the ability to share their knowledge with like the whole Burton crew. And they've got, he's like a solars too. Like there's all these guys who are like, man, who better? If you're pulling up to Whistler and you're like part of the younger generation of guys that haven't got a lot of back injury time and you want to go and hit a jump or ride some pillows or do whatever. If you didn't have guys like Mikey or solars or whoever on your crew you know, outside of Burton that have been here doing it for 20 years, you're cold going into the, like you're still going into some rent. You know how big it is out there. It's also spooky in some of the Super areas spooky, that, that, that have the pillows and stuff. Yeah. There's like, I'm thinking about going up Rutherford that there's the wall to the right before you get to the cabin. That's pretty safe. The wall yeah. to the left. If you don't know that wall, yeah. well, there's like a lot of that shit is huge and slides. Yeah. And, it, so, and then if you don't know what's above that, it's just like, so, dude, a bunch so of kids. what's the, what's the Ugh. value to a brand to be able to be like, Hey, keep we're we're keeping these guys on board like it's massive and and the fact that there is an industry that's able to support that i think is super important i think that's the the, industry standard now i look at like all the brands now especially all the brands that i ride for i'm looking like all of them they all have like the people that have been there for a long time i don't think they're going to get rid of them are they getting paid over six figures on the brand now? No, but like they know their lane and they're yeah. happy to be there. And the brand knows the, like 
what they bring to the table. Yeah. And I think it's a win-win for both parties. And they're like, let's fucking keep this going. Yeah, I think that's it. I think it's the, yeah, maybe you're right. Like I, from an outside perspective, I haven't looked into it enough to know what brands are still like on board with doing it. But I do feel like. Not all of them, but the yeah. majority. Yeah. And I think that it's right. a newer thing in the last couple of years. Right. In the last three to four years, brands are really, I think like they're realizing if you want to make, like, because every brand wants to be fully in-house for marketing, for photographer, for video. Yeah. So like if you have a brand. Sorry. You, yeah, no worries. <laughs> you hire like a, a filmer, you hire um, a photographer and you get your team and you want that whole team to make, um, you know, reels and Instagram shit for your brand and it's all about like marketing the fuck but you want to do all that in house now you don't want to yeah. have to pay somebody else to do it so if like your team in house is dialed it's like like you know you were saying burton and i'm thinking vans or whatever it's like you you're a unit already that you can just produce yeah. like whether that's going into the backcountry or filming in the rails or yeah, doing right. contests like if you have the mentors to lean on i think the brand wins at the end of the day yeah. For the little amount of money that they have to pay, like the ultra, like, you know, OGs, which I think is coming full circle now because a lot of the people that have inspired my generation and your generation and the generation before that know and appreciate when a brand does that. Yeah. And it helps There's us want to fuck with that sure. brand. There's yep. value with that. Yeah. And a lot of these parents don't even have Instagram or whatever anymore, but they still see that, they recognize that, and there's still a ripple effect yeah. in their community. To be the fifty-five-year-old guy who's like, I still really fuck with Vans and Volcom. Yeah, there's a reason, or, and and that's big. Yeah. And they're the, they're the people with the money. Well, they're spending can buy money on the their fan. kids exactly. and stuff, right? Exactly. I got to. I'm gonna. I got to pause for just a sec. I got to. Uh, I'm, <coughs> no. I'm gonna make you edit this out now because I have to extend my time for a minute. Oh, parking. Yeah. Oh shit. Me too. Uh, board collection. How many do you have total? Do you want the answer that I give my wife or the? Or the, like, no, the reality. real one's <laughs> reality. <laughs> um, I I can't tell you the exact number, but uh, having just moved a substantial chunk of the collection across the province, I can tell you that I think around four hundred. Four hundred. Around four. I mean, it might be about three something, but like the, just judging the weight of what the trailer loads and what I knew were in there, so like magazines and stuff in there too. So safe, safe, safe safe 350 ish <laughs> i don't know three say k350 say 350 oldest um, board that you have uh the oldest board i have is a uh bu- uh what's it called the bricklin or uh i'm totally brain farting right now bunker it's a it's an old metal that's the one that's like not it's like a stand-up sled how what year is that nice 60s or something like crazy old um i'll send it to you so you can uh, adjust that but anyway um as far as like a legit say snowboard i want to say like one that is a snowboard for sure um uh, the snurfers the 60 i have like a, a few snurfers and nash skifers and i have a i have a big collection of wooden stand-up rope boards from the 60s and then, uh, and then, yeah, I'd say like proper snowboards is like the winter sticks. I have a, I have a, the winter stick round tail and a winter sticks ball tail from 76. What's the most, uh, what's your favorite board in the collection? But like maybe one that's like kind of <laughs> means the most to you. Um, oh man. Cause a um, favorite would be kind of tough. I think. Yeah. I think. Yeah, there's it's really that's a difficult one because there's like ties to a lot of them just because of my snowboard history. So I'd say, um, I gotta have two actually. Um, one is is the Craig Kelly Mystery Air because that was like my, that was it, right? That one. So that's pretty sick. And then uh, the other one that I that is like a really cool special one for me um, uh, is uh, Kidwell. I have uh, his last race board. So I signed up. He was going to reissue his like like signature round tail a few years ago. I don't know if you ever saw that. But he was like the first pro rider round tail snowboard with Sims. Um, and he went back a few years ago and was going to remake those. Limited edition kind of like you can't find them. People are paying stupid amounts of money for them. 
So I signed up for one, and then they never ended up getting made, and he was refunding people, and I was like, oh, okay. Tech, I think we talked on the phone or whatever. He's like, oh, I got a couple boards. Like, if you want one of these ones or whatever. I was like, oh, like whatever. And he, he so he pulled out this, like, uh, 181 Sims race board that he had gotten made for him by Lofo, a guy in Quebec, um, with a broken tail and whatever. And then another board, which was a Burton, uh, a Burton race board that there isn't many of as well, but he won it as a prize and never used it. So it was just, like, in the wrapper style. Anyway, so yeah, Terry signed his writ because I was like, dude, that'd be all time for what I'm trying to do. Like, keep the money. I don't care if you don't want that. And so, yeah, he sent me his. So he told me it was the last board he raced on before Tom told him he didn't have to didn't have to race anymore or whatever because like, they were just doing freestyle stuff. Because up to that point, all, all those OG guys were doing like both. They were doing whatever, right, race events. So I had this giant big beater of a Sims race board that he, Terry had signed and I think that's a really cool one because it's like no one thinks back of Kidwell as a race guy. It's like you're thinking back of Terry as like iconic Freestyle. garbage dump, yeah. you know, like backside air. Like, you know, like, so it's a cool one to have. And But there's many more. Like I say that right now and I could change my mind tomorrow. I wanted to add 10 more to that list. What's the most expensive board in the line? Uh, oh man, I don't even know. Um, there's a couple... Uh, there's a couple that I wouldn't be able to uh, put prices on, you know, like just yeah. because they can't, you can't get them. Like even this, how do you put a price on a board that was like, it's not just the snowboard. It was like the, the board of this Lance guy, Man. you know, like you can find <laughs> another one. So I think I, I've luckily, I have a few of those in the collection that are like, and it's, it's hard to say because it's like I could, that you can't put a value on it and someone else might value it at much less. Someone else might value it as way more, but like, you know, something like this blue winter stick swallowtail. Um, I don't know how many of them are left in existence. I don't know how many were made. I haven't, you know, there's been talk of how many, but like when I first got it and put photos out of it, I had a, a collector from Europe that straight up was like, I'll send you eight grand for that board right now. And that was, you know, that was the year I broke my back. So that was like 2012. Wow. But it's probably because whoever that was. New. Well, not even just new, but maybe the guy's a millionaire and he wants that board because it's one he wants for his, you know, like yeah. there's a couple collectors in this world, which is really weird. Like there's a couple guys um, that have collections that are like, put m my collection is like junk. Really? Uh, oh, dude, it's crazy. Um, Would you say like, like how many people like 400 boards like there's it's not just the scale of how many it's also like the ones like the there's a guy so there's a couple other people involved in this museum project um and uh and both two of the other guys that are involved have collections that are like unbelievably crazy like you know have tom sims original silver 1500 that he used to show people with the leather zip up case and have to me, like the original red winter stick swallowtail that they only made, th you know, three of or whatever to go to Europe to show the Europeans a team that was re like, and you know, the team board from Keith Kimmel. The, the, there's like substantial amount of boards that were like the boards of the riders, like Rankwitz board. And like he's got boards that are like boards that I could never, you know, different different people with different abilities to collect things that are like, and, and there's guys that above that are like, you know, you know, very, very wealthy guys who, you know, I've seen photos of a wall in there, like chalet in Switzerland with like 20 Burton BB ones. And you know, like these boards, like these collectible wooden Burton boards that people are paying anywhere from five to 20 grand for. And he's got a wall of them, you know? Damn. Like, so when you see stuff like that, you're like, oh, you know, like I'm really stoked to have what I have. And there's a lot of stuff that I've been able to get because of how long I've been doing it and there's a lot of stuff that I've been given like the ones that Ken dropped off that were like super historical have like great meaning in what I want to do personally um, and have ties to the history and again like you can't put a value on that right like it's it's worthless to somebody it's just True. an old snowboard um, not but to you though <laughs> to me it's like you know it's really cool like I had a guy in Ontario reach out he's like hey I found this you know Kemper's rebooted but like before Kemper got sold to Salter and became Kemper that we knew it of the neon, David Kemper was making boards in, a, in his 
basement or whatever parents garage and like the year he sold the company he made x amount of boards and like if you look at the new kempers they made you know a reboot of it it's a whiteboard and spec and like this guy in ontario is like hey i found this board on marketplace and it's one of the original boards and it turns out the guys like bought it from david out of his garage and you know and it he helped me to to secure it and i paid for it and i got it for an amazingly good deal based on the fact of where it was coming and then that guy went out of his way to take it to david kemper at the law firm or wherever he works in ontario i forget exactly to sign it for me you know and all of a sudden i get this board that's like a handmade board from kemper before it got sold with handmade bindings that he made with who knows what and like okay well how many of those are in existence man like it's a very cool thing and if someone you know i know that i have to insure a lot of stuff and it's like a substantial amount of money because you can't you can't replace a lot of it and the only valuations you do have are what you see on ebay or collector's forums and that's skewed all the time based on who is buying it and how tied they are to having that as something and you know there's guys that are my age now that are financially stable beyond belief that are, are have no problems spending twenty thousand dollars on a snowboard you know and and like i said that the number of times i've been like holy crap like or my wife's been like why didn't you just sell that thing like you know it's like well i'll never find another one like <laughs> and i didn't pay that for it you know like i got it for a couple hundred bucks like so why would i get rid of it like you know if things get really terrible you know i'm like I need to pay for my kids to go be doctors or something. Sure, maybe one day I'll have to sell my collection to somebody. But hopefully it's in a position that it's sh- being displayed anyways, right? I can still come enjoy it. But That's true. Yeah. What board are you missing? Is there one board, board? in particular that you're like, I need this fucking board? Oh, man, there's more. There's so many more than one. Um, one, the Holy Grail one. Um, I think if I could... If I could secure one board and that was it, like, you know, the, the one board that I would love to put into my possession uh, is probably like one of the original uh, Terry Kidwell Roundtails. And that's like, I've seen them, they've come and go. I've, you know, I've had the ability or the chance to pick up a couple over the years, but again, it's, um, I can't justify. The value I can justify because I know it's worth that. But to myself personally, I'm just, I, I'm hoping that, you know, through the grapevine, one of, like, luckily, one of the other guys that's kind of involved in this project, he's got one. Nice. You know? So, like, there's a chance to hang them and I'll be able to see so whatever. So, there is, a there is a lot of people that I know that have these boards that are just like, I get to see. And I'm like, stoked they have them and they equally share that, the vision of like, I have these things and I love seeing them, but it would be great to share. Like, everyone's got the same kind of thing like you can how many boards can you put up in your house you know that's so true. you know these are all things where like i'm gonna have enough room to put a few boards up at the house but other than that like i've got a, a huge collection of boards that would be awesome to just show to other people so i like that you're like it's a huge collection it's 400 boards it's like the largest <laughs> collection i've ever so, heard of times in a million but a lot of them aren't but, stuff that are like you know a lot of them have no ties to like a timeline of things like if i if i narrow that down to boards that i would want to show like maybe there's 150 that would be like display like something that'd be cool whatever and there's a bunch of filler stuff that maybe you don't show or maybe is a little bit you put it into rotation um, but it depends on how far back you want to go and why you want to do it and like i said there's there's other people that have stuff that's like oh i have that board i have one but my you know i have somebody that i know that has that board but it was written by the guy who you know what i mean like he has roaches you know he has jamie's original octopus he has you know so when you have that stuff you're like okay well you know bet you got a couple boards in there that i really want probably yeah you'll have to come (laughs) and you'll have to come visit once i uh the new the new pad has enough space that i can uh, have a lot out to show so Nice. I won't have to have them all super uh, into a storage unit or secure in a way. I'll be able to have a few more out to show people. So That's fucking awesome. <laughs> um, I'm extremely jealous. I've, I've recently kind of started a small, pathetic collection, but I too one day hope to have 500 boards you, and annoy my wife and lie to her no, about how don't. many boards I have in you the don't fucking garage. Have, you don't want to have 500 <laughs> boards, trust me. How? Okay, these are 10 uh, quick questions. <sighs> Uh, kind of one word answer. Okay. Um, final ten. All right. Uh-oh. What's your favorite grab? Uh, nothing. Oh, 
I, sometimes it, do, it doesn't happen, you know? Meth is not my favorite crab, so I'm just like, yeah. who's who has your favorite method then? See, that's another one of those like can of worms because there's there's so, what if there's only one worm in the there's can? There's so many different styles, <laughs> right? There's it's so true. many different styles and yeah. methods. Um, inspiring wise of like looking at photos and seeing these things, I can like I can pinpoint certain ones. I can pinpoint Palmer, and I can pinpoint Jamie Lynn, and I can picture the picture that reminds me of it, right? But I can also look to Craven and I can look to Jake Blovelt and I can look like I can I I can there's guy Scott Shaw Scott Shaw eh? there's a, dude, a like, name that gets brought up a lot on the dude, show that, and, and nobody really knows him that well oh, dude that guy was a fuck that there river. there's one guy there's one guy that you asked me earlier like one of the guys that I shot with a lot that like I look back at a history of photos and the number of times I went out with and like he was always out with Craven he was always out with the early crew Dude, every time we went out, I got shots of that guy that were like phenomenal. The guy can like f- unbelievably beautiful turns, unbelievably stylish in the air. Like didn't matter what he was doing. He was like a shootable guy. But yeah, back like as far as methods go, man, like I can't pinpoint one person for a method. Quite honestly, it would be doing an injustice because I think like, you know, there's there is so many ways and there's so many different versions. And and I think it's more the riders who put that their own style on it right i you, can't you, I can't na- you named good ones those yeah. are good all right number two who has your favorite style or is this <sighs> another worm <laughs> it's all a wormhole it is it's such a big a it's a fan. giant wormhole <laughs> it's a giant wormhole man um yeah i i like i can't answer with one person i apologize okay to go to then I don't. I don't. Dude, that's oh. two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, style. Two, but not in any any order. You know, you're just picking two people. We won't uh, pinpoint them as the best. As, we'll far, just say as far as style. like, as far as those people that through my generation, like, and this is why I'm gonna say this. It's like, um, I think I think of like what I've seen presented to me in the last few years. The number of times I've been like scrolling Instagram and I've been like, what the, f-? and like rewound it because I can't figure out. You know, there's been a ton of those and it's from guys that, you know, like whether I can remember their names or not, I'm going to say. Um, but as far as timeless style um, and and being able to be like that person is like Jamie Lynn. You have to. He's, it still continues to look back at anything that he did and the style that he presented. So I was like, you know, I can say that. I'll just say Jamie Lynn. Um, yeah, that's that's and, a great answer. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, I don't know, man. Correct. But like, but but like, style. Who's you know, big mountain shred. Like, there's yeah. just so many things to yeah. it. But like, um, yeah, that iconic person who who has been inspiring for generations and who continues to inspire people and 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 offered up that style early on that people were like, well, emulating, and he continued to try to emulate. Right. So maybe that's probably the better answer of like someone who's held that timeless style that right now you can find it's a kid trend, who, it's transcendent who, who could watch that and be like okay i want to i want to look like that i yeah, still do so. want to look like jamie Lynn. yeah um number three favorite snowboard brand of all time all time or just one just a random one <laughs> Love that. Uh, let's see again um I'm going to have to go barefoot. Sick. And and certain reasons for that, I think they uh it's the people behind it and and how much stoke Chuck has had forever. Um and the fact that he still remains this like cool surfer guy that's just like, "Man, ah, I didn't make." You know, like he's just he's a such a good dude. Um but also because he supported Canadian snowboarding from the start through Ken and Boyer, like all those guys. And uh, and crazy early pro model graphics that were also like tied to Canadian artists and had you know so there's multiple reasons but that's a brand that I'm like man it was it's like they have a, a big part of my heart also because of the tie to the Kootenays of like those were the boards we started seeing come in and plethora of from the snowboard shop so that's no that was a, that was a fucking nice answer okay who's the best at building snowboard parks the best. The, yeah the best best 
Yeah, he's the best. I, I can't. I can't. Uh, oh, this is this is gonna be a can of worms too. I gotta. Like... <laughs> um, I I can't say. Um, I haven't been I haven't been following that scene enough to know who who uh, else is building. Let's say that I don't know who else is building, but I can say having watched what he's done and having seen the amount of things he's done to progress snowboarding and continues to do, it's Charles Beckinsale. I would agree. That yeah. guy's a fucking wizard. Yeah. Deepest powder day you've ever had. Where was it? Uh, Miyoko, Japan. Um, yeah. Good answer. I don't, How I, deep? <laughs> too deep to remember. Like, uh, and again, this is like, it's quite some time ago, but I was riding a giant board, like a one, I want to say it was a 180. It was a big board. Late 90s. Damn. And I remember having to stop a couple times going down because it was so deep that you couldn't get breath. Like having to stop to like, shovel arrow like shovel your mouth out because you're obviously riding with screaming and open your mouth but the thing that comes to mind that makes it feel like it was like bigger deeper than anything i had experienced and drier is because i remember looking up and like you know we've all ridden powder where you can look up and you see your track of where you rode but on this particular That's day fair. in the trees in miyoko i was like i could see a d indentation of where i had come from but it like just collapsed in, you know like just the snow that collapsed in and in that same day which also solidifies how deep it was i was shooting photos i was there with uh these two kiwi guys jeremy cared and um quentin robbins quentin both those dudes really good snowboarders and quentin went and hit there's these avalanche barriers oh, man i wish i remember the name of the seiki yeah seiki anyway somewhere near miyoko in japan and he hiked up to do this road gap off an avalanche barrier and the sequence that I took, and it's on slide film, so that dates how old it was, but he jumps off this avalanche barrier and then hits the slope on the landing side. And he pops out of the slope like 25 feet down because he didn't like land and then ride away. He like submerged and then popped out when the pressure from his board came out. It was deep. It was like beyond incredibly deep. So yeah, that would that would solidify it. I think it's just like I don't think I've ever experienced uh, snow that deep. Okay, dry. for the conspiracy theorists out there, oh, is there an ice wall when you go down to Antarctica? Because <laughs> you've been. Is there an ice wall? See, you're gonna open up a whole new thing. I'm not even so open. I've been to Antarctica because I'm a nerd that flies drones. Um, yeah, I did not <laughs> see an ice wall. Nice, but yes, apparently. Um, there is an ice wall down there. There's definitely an ice wall. Um, Damn it. But uh, <laughs> so the boat trip I was on, we spent 30 days on a boat for Nat Geo and, and we traveled pretty far down doing like looking at penguins and all these other things. Um, but yeah, you can you can go online and see because there's a big Antarctica is huge. So I've only seen a small portion of it. But yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a large chunk of Antarctica that's frozen and and uh, there's huge chunks of ice that cave off the wall for sure all right uh i don't know how i don't know how much has fallen off this year and like i am definitely not uh i'm definitely not one to give any dynamics of how how much is melting or whatever but i do i do know after being there that there's definitely you know i i i believe that climate change is real and oh. from from the people that i was with on that uh, trip that grew up in antarctica you know, born on sail ships in the ice frozen in Antarctica that have told me how much things have changed, that there's definitely some significant uh, environmental impacts that have that have happened. I believe you. Yeah. All right. Scariest photo you've ever taken. Oh, scariest photo. Uh, uh, back to the trip to Alaska with Newsom. Um we, uh, and I take this one on myself pretty personally, but, um, so we were shooting the bottom end. It was actually meteorite. It was a, it was like that day that was like blower deep, unbelievably good snow. The exit out of meteorite is into a valley or kind of traversing a ridge line. And there's some big panels that end it. Um, and we had handed, uh, so I was, I was shooting stills and, uh, buddy Frankie was filming 
and we had handed the remote or the radio to our helicopter pilot who was watching. He was just the heli was on sitting there beside us. And I just kind of said, oh, you know, if we need to get a hold of Scott, like Scott full guide style was wearing a radio so that we could guide him through if anything went bad. Um, and we had handed the radio to the heli pilot inadvertently, like not really thinking like we're, I'm going to be shooting stills. Frankie's filming and we were just like, he was an experienced heli pilot, but not really like someone that knew what should be going on. And our guide wanted to ride the line afterwards. So instead of being at the bottom, he was at the top. Um, and unfortunately Scott made 90% down meteorite and then, uh, kind of zig ratio zagged and started to traverse, but was in the wrong spot. And before we could, we were like, we knew what was going on and like yelling, tell him he's in the wrong. The heli pilot obviously didn't know what we were talking about. And the guide was at the top where he shouldn't have been either. Um, Scott got hit by a slough and, and basically about the time that he was going to go sideways backwards over a really big cliff he just knew he was going so he turned with the slough and pointed it off and I watched him get sloughed over like a really big cliff um, and pummeled at the bottom and ripped out of his like just like ripped his bindings out of his board and he, he blew his shoulder and did some damage for sure that was a scary one for sure because it was uh, it was the the feeling of helplessness, right? You're watching your buddy that's just like, oh shit, he's getting, he's going over. Um, and Scott's a beast. So he ended up crazy to this. We went and picked him up. We got him out with a heli. And he was like arm buckled, feeling really beatered, had ripped his bindings out. But he was like, well, this is going to hurt later. So let's go back to base and get a snowboard. And so we flew back to base with Alaska helicopters and he mounted like a <laughs> rental board, base, like a board they had. And we went out and <laughs> shredded. And in the end, like the cover I got of him at, over the spines in Alaska, he had his arm like in a sling ish, almost riding a board. He had just gotten from the base. <laughs> he was, bug he was buggered. And we, and that cover shot was shot after that. We went back and d did a bunch more lines because he was like, I wrecked my shoulder, but I can ride right now. And it's not, it's going to be worse tomorrow kind of thing. And we shredded like, we shredded a bunch more stuff that day and then took him to the airport. Uh, maybe that night or no, it was the next day. We actually went through all the RVs and tried to find whoever had painkillers. And he basically like got a, a bunch of random like pills <laughs> to like, cause we were in the middle of nowhere. Obviously he just, so he got like a little candy concoction of pills and Swallowed them all down to get him through the night. And the next morning we brought him to the airport and he had to fly out. And I think he had to have surgery on his shoulder after that one. But yeah, beast of a man, like went back shredding. We we did shred the next day. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, pretty, that was pretty fucking, crazy. Yeah. That was but I, I've been really lucky, man. I, I feel really lucky that um, hearing all the stories of people that have been in situations much worse, right? That have been stuck or like had to deal with people that were like, on the verge of dying or whatever and or being buried and i've been super lucky like all the years um been really lucky to be with good crews of guys who were comfortable in the mounts but also had enough smarts to them that we never we, like, again it's mother nature we were just lucky but um never really got put in a position where i had to watch guys get buried or whatever and there's definitely some sloughing and you know i've done a few drone day i've actually you know done a few drone days in the later years here that i've been experience to see some stuff go down that was a little scary to watch as well but like yeah I've, that's that was the biggest of them i think for sure all right who is the, the i won't say the goat because i feel like that's not going to help you with this situation there's but no, uh, no who's one of your favorite snowboarders of all time and who's one of your favorite photographers of all time uh craig kelly I gotta say it's like there's just no and that's again that's a timeline thing um it's funny you say you don't want to say goat uh, i was thinking about that because i've heard that term and i think it's a great term the greatest of all time i have a different i always think of it differently of the greatest of their time like the gut it's not the right one but i feel like there's a lot of people who had a huge influence on their time um and maybe don't transcend through everything, but like gave a lot to the sport. 
So, I, but I think, yeah, the greatest of all time, it has to be. Well, that's just because that was my, that's when I grew up. That was my, my Maybe time say on somebody it. who's overlooked then, just because uh, I'm curious of how you broke that down. Overlooked as far as what they gave to the industry? Yeah. Um, Maybe. I think you can, I think you can tie that back to like the early, I mean, you can go to each generation. You could go through every year, I think, and go through guys who, who gave it all or did a lot for snowboarding and never got the recognition or, or or just like kind of weren't around. And I think um, you can go back to those early guys who were involved with snowboarding, built brands for snowboarding and did everything they could because it was super fun and had all those things going for them, but were like behind the scenes or weren't the best businessmen or whatever. Um, and again, there's like, there's so many of them because those are the stories that I'm tied into that I can't really... I, I mean, I could give you names of guys who you could go and Google, you know, but um, athlete wise. Um, yeah, jeez, man. Uh, I'll just I'll, I'll pinpoint this down to athletes that I worked with, because I think that's the only way to because there's many guys that, you know, I've known and there's many guys I didn't get to shoot with. But as far as athletes I got to work with that I feel were very well like very undervalued as riders i think the one that stands out the most to me would be scott shaw that's good plug yeah um i'm gonna need to get some photos from you from scott but (laughs) do you want to hit us with a a photographer maybe somebody that just inspired you you don't need to say he's the best of all time but maybe a couple photographers inspirational photographers um i look back at bud fawcett um and the stuff before I knew who, you know, before I knew, you know, snowboarding, looking at magazines. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now that I've seen him, you know, putting out those images for years and knowing who he was, the stuff that was instrumental in, like, shaping my mind of snowboarding, my bud, was huge. Um, and then um, Dano. Like, and that was, like, capturing the Canadian, you know, and there's other guys like there again. There's so many other Sean uh, Sullivan. Look at Sullivan stuff too. Like there's, but yeah, like let's just say like you know Bud Fawcett is is was huge just for what he gave, and uh, and then Dano because you look back at at those early shots. But you know, let's keep naming them because there's Surface. There's all these. There's these guys who like I just you know we could name we you know them. Surface Surface you too. Yeah. <laughs> Sullivan. There's like there's just so many guys. Um, and uh yeah there's just there's worlds of guys who just gave so much to capturing all that stuff that are just you know, were instrumental in me from for seeing what snowboarding was and what it was becoming but also inspiring for like oh look at that like as a photographer you want to capture these things and you've seen guys that have done it and you're like yeah i want to capture something like that and you, you know you don't want to copy them but they're the ones who you're like shit <laughs> i should copy <laughs> yeah them. well that's it right but yeah yeah for sure maybe um on that note, thank you for coming on the show. In uh, closing, marks, is there anything, any advice you would give to um, a young Jeff who's, if you throw it back, <laughs> and what kind of advice would you what give? advice would I give myself? Yeah, what advice would you give to oh, a young version of yourself? Uh, I, think, I think if I could go back and give myself advice, it probably would be in the... Uh, uh, business and social relationships of uh of of the same like uh, i learned i basically learned business for myself because of what i did with parks and building and photography and everything but didn't necessarily um have the um capacity or the mental um uh, age to properly deal with some people so going back, I think I'd probably like take a step back before I open my mouth on a lot of things That's I did. Fucking good advice. That's um, really good advice. Because for the number of times that me uh, being outspoken about things that got me good places, because people were like, "Oh, okay, you should listen," it equally was destructive in the fact that I was I had that head on my shoulders where I just didn't give a fuck, and that bit me a few times for sure. And it was it wasn't because of anything that I thought 
you know, it's just that it was quick. You're not thinking before you open your mouth and then and then realizing the effects of it years later where you're like, oh, that was a bad move. But you know, at the time, it's like you're you're tied to things emotionally because of, again, I was like hyper focused on certain things. So you get tied very emotionally to things that you're like a big part of. So I put my heart and soul into a lot of things. And when you're that tied into things, that one little thing that wrongs you could become the ignition source for like a lot of things that might have nothing to do with that, but you let it out at that, you know, one person or one thing. So that's yeah, probably it, man. Just taking a, taking a step back once in a while and being like, I'm going to take a breather and, and decide whether or not I should say that or write that comment in that email. Because I definitely heard that a few times from people, you know, where they're like, yeah, we heard that you're like a pretty fiery. I'm like, what? You know, like, and then it's come on. Oh yeah, I guess like, you know, you probably talk to that guy like you know so yeah maybe that's it that's really good take advice. a take a moment to take a moment to uh realize that there are people out there that might want to help you and they're not you might not agree with them but snapping at them isn't going to help you so okay on that note thank you so much for shooting um photos for the last 25 i don't know maybe 30 years thanks for falling <laughs> in love with a snowboard thanks for building all these parks jumps that I've hit personally jumps that a lot of um, the best snowboarders in the world have hit and those have helped shape um, the video parts that we all know and love and the images. Um, it's wild to think of what this landscape would uh, look like without you, Jeff. It's uh, it is, it's crazy. It's like you've been doing it for so long. It's like the I remember looking through old Snowboard Canada magazines and you were one of the first photographers that really sat in my mind because I was a big Dustin Craven fan. Oh, yeah. And it was when Dustin, TJ, Dwayne, Todd, oh, crew. that whole crew was all hitting the longest rails in the world. <laughs> and so I would read, because then you would read the caption, you'd be like, what the fuck is going on? Oh, it's Dustin. And then so then I started getting to know your name because right. at that point it was all about how many stairs you were riding. Yeah, right. And Dustin and TJ were hitting like the longest rails on earth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I couldn't fathom so, that. So thank stuff. you. Was, yeah. And I got to thank all those riders too, right? Like I, the people who gave me those opportunities to, to travel and shoot and build jumps and do all those things and um, Bridges and Sullivan and uh, Matt Houghton, all the guys from the magazines. Like I, I got a lot of support, which was awesome. And um, I'd never be here, be doing those things as long as I did if I didn't have the support of all the riders and the support from the people at the magazines and and the support of the crew of snowboarding really like like i said it's a later in life i've learned that that's my you know i i had that brain that needed to have that feedback and and finding my people in snowboarding early gave me that and has let me do what i've done for a long time and i um i think you know that's a big deal to be able to find that supportive community and i'm very lucky that i did so hopefully there's, you know, I know there's lots more in my footsteps and other people that have done the same and um, the community's still there. It's changed a lot, but, you know, you look at all those, all the crews that are still out there doing the same thing and it, that's why they're doing it. They have their buddies, they're going out. It's a crazy, it's a crazy supportive community and it hopefully will stay that way forever so that, you know, my kids can do it and they'll be equally as hooked and continue the, continue the um, hyper, cycle. hyper focus cycle. <laughs> And the hyper focus cycle yeah. will continue. Thank yeah, you right. again for coming on. Thanks, Jody. Take care.